Um, so yes, we're here today uh, for an introduction to intra integrated hydrologic modeling with hydrogeosphere. My name is Braden McNeil. We've all been in contact before. Um, I like to start the course with my camera on just so that everyone can see my face, uh, but I do find it a bit distracting. So I'm going to turn it off right now. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll uh, get into the course here in just a minute. We're going to try and make this uh, entire training session really focused on the practical aspects of using hydrogeosphere. But I do have uh, some early slides here, which uh, just basically discuss the sort of design philosophy behind hydrogeosphere and uh, uh, things to consider when you're taking a, a really physics based approach to integrated hydrologic modeling. Before we do begin, I like to make a small land acknowledgement. Uh, if you're not uh, from Canada or not familiar with our history, like many colonial uh, nations or nations with a colonial past, we've had a difficult uh, and fraught relationship with the indigenous people of this land. As a country, we're embarking on a journey of truth and reconciliation. And one small way that I can contribute to that is to at least acknowledge the fact that uh, Aquanti and most of our employees uh, do live and work here in Waterloo, Ontario which is on what's known as treaty land. Um, it's uh, actually the Haldeman Tract was was granted to the Six Nations of the Grand River, i.e. the the traditional inhabitants of this land, including the neutral or Atawandaran, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. The treaty uh, basically de designated land to six miles on either side of the Grand River, which kind of meanders around uh, in the middle of this green tract of land. Uh, six miles on either side of the Grand River given to the the peoples of the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, in perpetuity. As you can see today, less than 5% uh, of that original tract of land, that's the small orange area over here, is uh, currently under the administration of the Six Nations of the Grand River. So as I said, uh, just want to acknowledge the fact that Aquanti is very privileged um, to be able to live and you know work here in Waterloo, Ontario. So let's get into uh, integrated hydrologic modeling. As you're probably aware, uh, hydrogeosphere is a fully coupled and tightly, or rather a, uh, a tightly coupled and fully integrated hydrologic model. In the history of hydrologic models, um, the traditional approach has been to model surface water or groundwater systems separately. Um, so groundwater and surface water models will only look at a single component of the hydrologic cycle. As computer resources have become more prevalent and more powerful, um, you know, hydro hydrologists have, have begun uh, applying more complex models um, and modeling techniques to simulate the, the hydrologic cycle. Loosely coupled models are essentially two or more separate models or modules that have uh, basically linkages built in between them. Whereas, uh, and those those two models will run in serial, uh, but over an iterative process. One model, maybe the groundwater model, will run first and converge upon a solution. Some information will be exchanged to uh, a surface water model. That surface water model will then iteratively solve and then converge upon a solution. And information is then passed back to the groundwater model until and unless the information being exchanged back and forth between these two distinct models match the model will not be able to converge upon a, a full solution for the entire system of, of models and won't be able to move forward. Uh, so loosely coupled models essentially have multiple levels of iterations going on as they try to move from one time step to the next and solve uh, the simulation period. Whereas a fully coupled model like hydrogeosphere basically represents the entire hydrologic cycle within a single model and what i really mean by that is within a single matrix of equations um, now i've been meaning for ages to try and clean up these uh, images but what we're doing when we build a model of course is we have a number of governing equations that are applied in order to solve the basically the system of how water is flowing through a landscape uh, a loosely coupled model may have what I've got this this gray blob up here might represent like a surface water model, whereas down here where we have a more 3D shape would represent the groundwater model. 
Um, these two models can exist as distinct things where we have one system of equations up here, which exists to solve the surface flow, and then a separate and, and similar system of equations that exists for the groundwater system. And there may be nodes which are common, so we may have this node right here uh, be replicated and, and sort of it's a dual node that exists within both of these modules. The process of solving this system of equations is iterative and the system or the process of solving this system of equations is also iterative with a loosely coupled model. In addition to the individual iterations for each model, they have to pass information back and forth, right? Hydrogeosphere is is a system where we we actually build in the different model domains or the different portions of the hydrologic cycle into a single global matrix. So we may essentially what we have is we we take both of these systems of equations and we simply nestle them together. So we would have a portion of our linear algebra sort of matrix of equations dedicated to the unknown values in the porous medium domain and a separate portion of our matrix of equations would be dedicated to the OLF or the surface domain OLF, meaning overland flow and PM here standing for porous medium. And we may have other sets of unknowns, for example, evapotranspiration, fracture domain flow, et cetera, et cetera. But in all cases with a fully or a tightly coupled model like hydrogeosphere, we are building all of the different governing equations into a global matrix of equations, which is solved in one iterative process. <clears throat> so essentially what we've we've done with a fully coupled model is collapsed all of those different iterative processes into something that that occurs simultaneously. <clears throat> There are many, many, many models out there. Um, as we move towards a more fully integrated and tightly coupled model system, which is over here on the right, which is where hydrogeosphere resides, we are essentially building a more physically realistic representation of the real world. Um, and these models are only able to run due to their higher levels of numerical sophistication and the way that we we actually implement the uh, the system of equations and and the way that we solve them over on the left hand side we have the separate groundwater surface water models of varying complexity and the surface water domain lumped hydrologic response units are the simplest they're stati statistical relationships essentially um, but we do also have distributed PDE uh, systems of, uh, ground, of, of surface water models where we basically will discretize the, the model domain or the model area into a mesh or a grid. And then we, we apply, apply in a, um, and solve the governing equations at each one of these, these cells. It's the same thing that we're doing with uh, groundwater models typically, as well as coupled groundwater surface water models. Um, but most groundwater models have, you know, their their limitations. Mod flow, for sure, the most commonly used uh, hydrologic model in the whole world. It only looks at fully saturated groundwater flow, whereas more advanced groundwater models may look as well as as uh, in addition to the fully saturated, they can look at variably saturated flow. So basically, all water flow in the subsurface. As we move further to the right here, we get loosely coupled models like Mike Shi, where again, the different domains, we've got the one, two, three. So we may have different modules for overland flow, for variably saturated flow, and then for saturated groundwater flow. And again, these models are just linked up together and they exchange information back and forth. Whereas with a tightly coupled model like hydrogeosphere, again, we take all of these different processes and we build them into one single global model, one global system of equations. The reason that we want to take an integrated approach and, and model um, both groundwater and surface water at once is because well, it uh, is again the most physically realistic way of of representing the water cycle, um, and the hydrogeosphere approach is to really have an emphasis on on physics based flow as opposed to uh, relying on empirical relationships. Um, so we we try to simultaneously account for all of the interactions, all of the different flow processes. Basically, every process that you see listed on this diagram on the right is something that hydrogeosphere is able to model and simulate internally. 
I guess the one exception here being <clears throat> precipitation, which is typically applied as a boundary condition to a hydrogeosphere model. But as I like to say, as soon as precipitation meets the ground surface, hydrogeosphere is able to kick in and really basically use a physics-based approach to model where that that water will go. So hydrogeosphere will dynamically calculate overland flow and partitioning of overland flow into infiltration, uh, the movement in three dimensions of that infiltrated water through the Vados zone or the unsaturated zone down to the groundwater table. Fully saturated flow is also done, of course, in full three dimensions. Um, we're able to handle storage uh, and, you know, three dimensional soil moisture here in the unsaturated zone. We can handle perched water tables. Uh, and then all of the ET processes in here as well are, are something that are built directly into hydrogeosphere. Hmm. Um, and why we want to do it is basically the assumptions built into any model are invariably the locations where the those models are weakest. So surface water models traditionally have not treated the subsurface flow uh, system with with much respect, let's say, uh, there will be always assumptions made in terms of surface water models as to how much water uh, in the surface system is contributed from groundwater base flow, for example. And again, those assumptions are the weakest points of any model. Similarly, groundwater models will ignore the dynamics of overland flow. Uh, you know, hydrologists or hydrogeologists will, you know, when building groundwater models, typically need to find some way of, of converting precipitation data to recharge. And the coupling between surface and subsurface domains is, is achieved through sources and sinks, i.e. As, as boundary conditions applied to the model. Uh, and if you're applying uh, any boundary conditions to your model, that means that, that that boundary condition, that hydraulic feature that's represented by a boundary condition becomes an input to your model as opposed to an output. If you run a, a surface water model and you are applying an, a, a a prescribed amount of base flow. Um, well, that means that the model itself is not able to physically determine what type of or what quantity of base flow should be appropriate based on the you know current hydro hydraulic con hydrologic conditions. Similarly, if you build a groundwater model and you need to represent the impacts of a lake, well, you are with a groundwater only model, you are essentially mathematically nailing that lake to the wall and you're saying the the hydraulic you know the elevation or the stage of this lake is a is a defined aspect of them of the model which means that your model is not going to be able to represent um you know the impact of changing hydrologic conditions on the lake itself the lake becomes you know a set in stone component of that model and so uh, taking a physics based approach to simulating water movement, which is really what hydrogeosphere is all about, removes these uncertainties and these assumptions from the model itself. We basically uh, we, we build a physically realistic digital twin of a landscape. We apply easy to source information such as precipitation and temperature data. Easily easy to measure these these uh, data and there there's no processing required to convert precipitation, for example, into groundwater recharge. We simply apply atmospheric precipitation and temperature data to a physically realistic landscape uh, or digital twin of a landscape, and we let the water flow where the physics dictates where it should flow. Um, so it, it's the most realistic way of representing water movement. It's also the only uh, and most accurate way of simulating hydrology under the entire range of hydrologic conditions that may be experienced in the future from from drastic floods to to really intense droughts. Also, a physics based approach is the best way of of testing design topographies. So, for example, if you're going to yeah, introduce a dike, for example, to a, a floodplain. You know, there's no way of of beforehand a priori determining, you know, how that dike will necessarily perform in the context of an empirical model, because there's no data to inform that empirical model, right? Um, and you know, a physics-based approach is also re really excels at at modeling unknowns. So that includes unknown climate uh, trends, for example, in, in the future, these 
different uh, empirical relationships that have been traditionally used to design water resources infrastructure. You know, they're predicated on historical trends that m are becoming less and less reliable. Um, HGS and this physics based approach is also really powerful for modeling uh, basins or regions that have very little observation data. So, you know, the 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 plethora of assumptions that have gone into traditional models really require a lot of parameter estimation and calibration. You really need to torture the model in order to get it to fit uh, observed behavior. With a physics based model, uh, we tend to have a much higher rate of success in just modeling, um, you know, modeling watersheds and, and river basins that have very, very little observation data against which to calibrate your model. So this is really the full design philosophy behind hydrogeosphere. As much as possible, we want to have an emphasis on physics, minimize the use of empirical relationships. Uh, this means that we typically model things at the watershed scale, but it is, of course, possible to model uh, at any scale, really. It's fully integrated, uh, which means all components of terrestrial flow are accounted for. 3D, um, you know, two-dimensional or pseudo 3D surface flow. We've got variably uh, saturated subsurface flow. Solute transport is also um, supported. We can incorporate discrete fracture networks. We can perform mass and thermal energy transport modeling. We support a dual porosity or dual permeability formulation. Winter processes, we support time varying material properties. We can incorporate one dimensional hydraulic features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A very, very, very feature rich um, program with, with many, many capabilities here. I, I won't delve into too many details here when it comes to the, the math here and the governing equations of flow in HGS. We do have a theory manual and other resources that I'll introduce today, and I highly encourage you to explore those yourself. Um, I'm probably not really qualified to do a great job explaining all these governing equations, to be perfectly honest, but we'll just give a brief introduction here. In the subsurface, um, we are applying a 3D form of Richards equation for variably saturated flow. Uh, in the surface domain, we are using uh, actually the same Vinat equation, so it's the diffusion wave approximation of the St. Vinat equation for surface flow. Um, Pipe flow, uh, fracture flow, variably saturated fracture flow and pipe flow. These are uh, accomplished using Manning's equation typically. We support a couple of different options in terms of how um, how these how exchange will will occur between different model domains. The, uh, the the recommended approach is to use what we call the dual node formulation. With the dual node formulation, what it does is it basically causes any nodes in the model that coincide to multiple domains. In, in other words, if there's a node that, that is present in both the surface as well as the subsurface, or if there's a node where we, we will apply a discrete fracture network that also coincides, of course, with the porous medium or the subsurface domain, then what we'll do with the dual node formulation is essentially have two separate nodes. The, these nodes are treated as distinct entities in terms of the numerical implementation but in terms of physical reality the two nodes are superimposed on the exact same location they're separated virtually by a coupling distance which is this d naught value here um, and what this allows us to do is to explicitly calculate the exchange so that's what this uh, this i don't even know what uh, greek letter this is but that's what this um this symbol here is representing is the discrete exchange of, of water, the flow of water between the surface and the subsurface in this case. So depending on which um, different model domains we're coupling together, we'll specify a coupling distance and a some sort of coupling conductance term. The actual flow between the two then is driven by the hydraulic head difference between those two nodes, i.e., you know, the surface water depth in the surface domain versus, you know, compared against the uh, the hydraulic head in the porous medium. Um, another major benefit of having this dual node formulation, in addition to being able to explicitly calculate the exchange of water between domains, is that it also uh, makes the, 
the the system much more numerically stable. So it really eliminates a lot of convergence issues, um, which is something that is very frequently uh, and very commonly a problem with uh, with loosely coupled models. Um, in terms of solute transport, you know we've got a uh, coupled adver advection dispersion uh, equation shown here. We also support reactive solute transport as well. Um, so all of the different <clears throat> solute transport mechanisms that you would expect are represented in HGS. But I just in this slide, uh, note again that there is a, a coupling term uh, embedded in our solute transport equations, which again allow us to have distinct surface and subsurface concentrations or distinct concentrations in different model domains which allows us to explicitly calculate the exchange of solute between those domains and of course also helps to eliminate with uh, convergence issues. Hydrogeosphere uh, is a valid solution at all scales, really from, from really, really, really large river basin models that may be hundreds of thousands or even millions of square kilometers, all the way down to smaller field scale models. In fact, we've started to build some uh, some systems whereby we can run column models, which really are just at you know one meter by one meter, and can have a incredible amount of vertical uh, resolution uh, to to more accurately simulate um, you know soil physics and uh, soil moisture in the near subsurface. But uh, truly, we we have a huge, huge uh, list of case studies and users out in the world who are applying HGS at, at all model scales. The question then becomes what, uh, you know, in terms of model scale, what, what type of scale should you uh, seek to, to build for your own models? Um, <clears throat> at high, at Aquanti, we tend to we tend towards building large models. Um, we'll, we'll usually build the boundary of our model based on a, a catchment or a watershed. And the reason for that is because by working at the catchment scale, it can really simplify the application of boundary conditions. As we said, as I said before, we really want physics to be the, the primary um, driver of flow within the model. If we work at a watershed scale, we can make some broad assumptions that topographically all surface water is going to flow towards one common outlet and if we further make the assumption that <clears throat> the the surface water topography right so the the surface water catchment broadly generally follows the same outline as a as a groundwater uh, aquifer catchment let's call it i.e that we have a, essentially groundwater divides at the edges of our watershed then basically our models boil down to applying just a handful of boundary conditions. We'll have some critical depth boundary condition at the outlet, which would allow surface water flow in the river network to exit the model. And then we'll apply precipitation, spatially varying precipitation over that watershed. Uh, otherwise, in the porous medium domain, all of the edges you know, would be assumed to essentially be no flow boundary boundaries. Um, and this is, again, just a very, very physically realistic way of conceptualizing flows within a watershed. <clears throat> now, if you are working at a watershed scale, obviously your model is going to be quite large. It can be tens of thousands of kilometers or, or even more. The really important question when it comes to the building out a mesh is how many total nodes you're going to have. Uh, this example here is of the Grand River watershed, you know, using a triangular element mesh that has variable refinement, which is especially refined around the river network. This uh, model is basically, I think, about 30,000 square kilometers, has a total of 3.5 million nodes distributed across 15 layers. I would highly recommend that you limit yourself to uh, smaller models. Uh, 3.5 million total nodes is probably even at the higher end of what we would be comfortable doing here at Aquanti, and we have we have some quite powerful computers at our at our disposal. We typically recommend that you try to keep your models to a million nodes or less. The more nodes that you introduce, along with the process complexity of running these nonlinear flow equations, and then potentially incorporating other advanced processes like solute transport, um, these models can take a long, long time to run. The number one factor that's going to increase model runtime is typically going to be your total node count. And so this is why we, we really do recommend trying to limit yourself to a million nodes or less. 
And that shouldn't be too difficult, frankly. Uh, you can get a lot of, of uh, spatial resolution uh, with, with one million nodes. It's at the end of the day, just really a question of making sure that you're modeling uh, at the right scale for the questions that you're trying to answer. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to skip right past this slide and I'll go to this next one here, which shows just a very simple cross-sectional model, uh, but really well, um, I think it does a really, really good job of highlighting some of the benefits of hydrogeosphere. So again, if you were to run a, a groundwater model, you would typically apply surface water features like ponds or lakes as boundary conditions. Um, and that means that basically you're specifying what the elevation of that pond stage might be. And it simply acts as typically like an infinite source of water. In this case, what we're doing is we're seeing these potholes basically dynamically fill up. And then as our precipitation uh, is turned off and basically the inflow of water from overland flow is turned off, we're then able to, over the course of a few days here, simulate the infiltration of that water, the movement of a, of a, of a wetting front through the uh, subsurface. Eventually it you know, encounters a clay layer. We now have a perched aquitard and as well through that clay layer, we've seeded it with a number of fractures, right? So we can see preferential flow paths through that clay aquitard. It's quite a simple model conceptually. It's something that hydrogeosphere is able to handle quite easily. Uh, but this type of model, uh, there, there's several things going on in this model that would simply be impossible to, to model with most other commercially available modeling products. And this video as well just basically shows the same thing, right? The, the dynamic and uh, explicit exchange of flow between surface and subsurface. Um, and kind of illustrates a lot of the other capabilities uh, of hydrogeosphere, having tunnels through your, your model and incorporating discrete fracture networks, how infiltration and exfiltration is all dynamic and, and part of the model output. So the exchange flux and, um, you know, base flow to streams, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, this is just the, you know, Tried to get through that relatively quickly, about 30 minutes, just a broad overview of what hydrogeosphere is really all about, the design philosophy and, and the, the physics-based modeling approach. We're going to spend the next two and a half hours really just focusing on the practical aspects of using hydrogeosphere. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and just ask them as they come up. Uh, I usually find that uh, that's probably the, the best way to, to approach this training session. Um, and as I go through here, I apologize if it seems a bit uh, disorganized. I like to minimize my my slides here and refer back and forth to some real models. So I'll be running some models here with you and uh, we can take a look at the outputs and things as we go along. OK, so before we uh, really dive into how to use hydrogeosphere, we'll just introduce you to a couple of key resources. Um, so when you install hydrogeosphere, it'll be under the C drive program underscore files hydrogeosphere. There's a couple of uh, really good resources here in the installation folder. Uh, first, we're going to want to take a look at our docs or our documents. So these are basically three different manuals that we have. Uh, we have a theory manual, a reference manual, and a verification manual. We'll get them all opened up here for you. So we'll start with our theory manual. Um, well, basically, the three, three manuals are explained here. The theory manual provides a description of the conceptualization of integrated hydrologic systems, i.e. the governing equations of flow that we're applying, uh, as well as the numerical implementation and how we've, you know, how we construct our system of equations, what kind of system or process is used to invert and then solve that system of equations, i.e. the Newton iterative uh, solving uh, solver process. Um, if you're going to be running any kind of particular project, whether it's solute transport, you, you're definitely going to want to take a, a good read through this manual. It's only, you know, if we don't count uh, the back pages with references and everything, it's it's really only about 100 pages long. Chapter two here is all about theory. So we've got the theory of flow in the subsurface, in the surface, in one dimensional hydraulic features, how coupling is, is handled between different domains, how boundary conditions are implemented. And then we've got a sections on solute transport, et cetera, et cetera. 
Chapter three then takes a look at numerical implementation. In other words, how have we discretized uh, these different governing equations of flow? How we, you know, approach the control volume finite element method, and essentially how do we, yeah, discretize the system of equations, build them up into a matrix, and actually actually solve the model. So again, if you're going to be using this for research or for, uh, you know consulting it's it's really incumbent on you to read this manual and understand how hydrogeosphere works nobody should treat any model as a black box so you know that just magically produces results it's really important to know how these things work uh, under the hood our second manual here is the verification manual and so this manual provides a review of the nearly three dozen example problems that are included on installation so here in the uh, installation folder, we have a verification subfolder. Every folder that you find in here is a distinct project, a hydrogeosphere model that's included on installation. You can use these models as your own sort of, uh, you know, learning tools for one, but also as the as the sort of starting point for your own projects. Um, the verification manual provides a description for every one of these examples. If we go to the very beginning of chapter one here, we have a table which basically lists all of the different verification tests and which section of this manual they relate to. If we look at one here at, at random, maybe Pande, it basically brings us to section 1.4.2, 3D surface subsurface flow and evapotranspiration. Um, so even just by reading the, the description of this section, I know that this is an integrated surface and subsurface model that also incorporates evapotranspiration. And therefore I can, you know, reading between the lines, I, I, I know that I can use this example problem as a potential uh, blueprint or sort of guidance for building my own model that would incorporate evapotranspiration. Each section just provides maybe an, a couple of images and a table, you know, describing the, uh, the different parameters that we've built into this model provides a reference uh, to the original um, to the original publication. Typically an analytical solution has been published. These are the models actually that we use every month when, when we release a new version of the software. We'll run each of these models and we'll compare the the results to the analytical solutions to ensure that the, the software isn't broken and that everything's still working as expected. If you're ever Again, interested in running a particular type of model. Maybe it's maybe it's a transport model. You can come to this manual, do a quick keyword search, and it'll bring you to a relevant section. At the beginning of each section, it tells you, you know, this problem or the problem described in this section relates to this particular test case, right? So then I can go and open up that that verification test PMCD in this case, and I can use this as my guidance for how to build up um you know a problem that is based around chain decay transport within a porous medium further you know we could look for other keywords fracture okay chain decay transport in a single fracture well i can look at the fcd test case and again use that as my as my starting point for building my own models and then finally and possibly most importantly for you at this stage in in learning about hydrogeosphere would be the reference manual so this is by far the largest manual. It, it basically contains all of the different commands that are available for Hydrogeosphere's preprocessor Grok. The process of building a Hydrogeosphere model, as you'll see today, is basically you, you create a text-based input file. That text-based input file will use a number of commands to essentially describe the model. And every one of those commands is basically described here in the reference manual. So the majority of this manual is taken over by chapter two. We have a section or a subsection within each of um, within chapter two for most of the major components in a grok file, defining initial conditions, boundary conditions, defining your grid, um, applying materials and material property zones, things like that. So as you learn hydrogeosphere, what you're really going to want to do um, is basically spend some time looking at several um, you know, maybe five or 10 example problems. Some of the problems that you may find, you know, listed in the verification manual, for example. And as you read through these problems, um, you look through the Grok files and, and begin to encounter these commands. You'll want to keep the reference manual handy so that you can look up 
what the command does and basically how it works. Uh, before we go any further, I'll just note that there is a bit of a formatting convention in this reference manual. <coughs> if you see any words with a preceded by a solid line like this and in this format, this is a command. So the, the command name here is generate uniform blocks. Many commands require additional input instructions. So in addition to just saying the command, you'll have to provide some numerical values or whatever the case might be in order to actually make that command work. We just ignore this image for a moment, but if you see a command that's followed by a numbered list, that means that there would be, in this case, one, two, three additional lines of text required to use this command. And on each one of those lines of text, we'll have potentially one or, or more uh, variables, individual variables that, that will need to be specified. In this case, well, th there's also then going to be a description of what the command does. In this case, this command of generate uniform blocks will generate a grid for a rectangular domain made up of uniformly sized blocks. And the way that it works is we would define XLEN or the domain length, and then we would define NBX or the number of blocks, both of those in the X direction. And then we would specify those variables as well in the Y and the Z direction. And after having used this command, basically a grid would now exist. Then we can then go and apply boundary conditions to it, et cetera, et cetera. So the reference manual is a really key resource. Um, make sure that you've got a copy of it handy as you as you begin to explore hydrogeosphere. So I've I've talked about uh, this grok executable. I mentioned how we write input files. Um, let's take a closer or just a brief look at what this overall workflow looks like. Whenever you work with hydrogeosphere models, you're going to always need to follow these five steps, and it starts by writing a grok file. This is just a text-based input file that you can use uh, or that you would write to describe the model. Every grok file, uh, pardon me, every grok file has a few um, common components to it. So just by the way, I'm looking at this grok file here. It's I'm using Sublime Text, and we do have a language package for Sublime Text, uh, which is what is resulting in this color coding here, which can make it a little bit easier to read these um, these model input files. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to this again in a little bit later on, but I know it usually comes up as a question. People wonder, you know, why do I have this special formatting? But this grok file is indeed just a text file. You can open it in any text editor, uh, but every grok file is going to have typically a few common sections. We will usually well, we will always start with the grid generation section. We'll have a series of commands that basically define the model mesh. Once the mesh has been defined, we will typically see a section where we define general simulation parameters. These are just basic, usually one line commands that that help to define the overall nature of the model. For example, whether we're going to be running it in transient or steady state whether it will be a, a fully saturated versus a variably saturated model, whether we do the dual node formulation or the common node formulation, we can define units and things like that. We'll then typically have a section where we begin defining material properties, so porous medium properties, things like your hydraulic conductivities and uh, porosities, things like that. And if you're using additional model domains, such as surface flow, then we'll also need to define properties for those additional domains as well. More, we'll have more on properties and how to assign them later. Um, we'll then usually get into a section here where we start to define, you know, initial conditions, which is what's being done in these few lines. Uh, we'll then define boundary conditions. You know, we're always going to see that in every grok file. Uh, towards the end of most grok files, you'll start to see information about you know, new, uh, numerical simulation criteria, uh, how time stepping will work, information about minimum and, ma minimum and maximum time step sizes, things like that. And uh, finally, we'll have uh, a section for model output. So we might define distinct points in time where we want model output to be written to file. We can also define other key uh, output commands like flagging individual nodes as observation points or defining hydrographs or, you know, there's many, many, many other options as well. Uh, 
But as you can see here, this entire line is about 250. Uh, sorry, this entire file is only 250 lines or so of text. Most of the commands are plain English. Make observation well, make observation point, output times, you know. So you don't have to be a coder to read these files or to create these files. Um, they're, you know, like I said, it's just a simple command based language. But all Grok files are generally going to have a, an outline similar to this. Um, some people may define things in different orders. Uh, the only real rule is that you always have to start with a grid generation, at which point you can go to boundary conditions or you could go straight to defining initial conditions. Uh, it's really up to you. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to generally see all of these different um, components to a Grok file for every model. So that's step one, we write the grok file. Then we'll run grok.exe, and then we'll run phgs.exe, and then we'll run hsplot.exe, and then we'll review and visualize the results. Each of these different executables serves a different purpose. Um, basically, well, I've got them outlined here on the next slide, actually. Grok is what we call a preprocessor for hydrogeosphere. It basically reads through the Grok file, that text file that you've constructed, and it executes the commands that it encounters. And what this does is it basically begins to generate all of the input files that are actually necessary for the numerical simulator itself, and that is PHGS. This really is what hydrogeosphere is, phgs.exe. It is really the uh, it's the executable that is taking the system of equations and and solving it producing results and, and basically generally performing the simulation itself because hydrogeosphere is fully integrated uh, as you know with groundwater surface water and also has you know it's a three-dimensional variably saturated flow hgs usually produces much much more data uh, than other models will uh, and so we write all of the output typically well 99 percent of the data output by phgs.exe will be in binary format and so the next executables either hsplot or hgs to vtu it's up to you which one you'd like to choose uh, they will process model output into a format that can be used uh, or into a format that can be read by a 3D visualization product such as TechPlot or Paraview. And then finally, step five is to, of course, review and visualize your results. Um, that whole aspect is a little bit beyond me. I'm not a professional hydrogeologist or a professional modeler. I like to say I know just enough to be dangerous, not enough to really be super helpful uh, when you get into a situation where you're getting some difficult uh, results that you're having trouble analyzing. So you're kind of on your own for this section. Well, I say you're on your own. I'm, I'm always open to helping, so feel free anytime to reach out with questions. Um, but certainly we're going to be focusing today on basically these first four steps. So let's take a closer look at this overall workflow step by step. Now, step one is to put together the Grok file, and I've already taken you through my whirlwind tour of the common components of a grok file so there's not much else to say there um, but this is where every project really starts I'll, I'll just use this moment as a reminder to say that you know we we do have over 30 sample grok files in the installation folder and these different files these different verification tests they're meant to basically test every major feature that hydrogeosphere offers and so you can use these grok files as your starting point as your you know you can basically just take one of these projects whether you're looking to do a solute transport model through a fractured porous medium for example just take one of those existing verification tests copy it and then start swapping in your own project based uh, project specific information there's no need really to define or to write a grok file from a blank slate uh, at any point we really do encourage people to just use the the templates that we basically provide through these verification tests so step two then is to run grok and the way that we do that we run these executables through the command prompt um, the best way to launch the command prompt is simply to navigate to your projects folder in other words the folder where your grok file sits and what you'll do is you'll type into the the address bar cmd and that's going to open up the command line 
Optionally, you can also type in PowerShell. This opens up a beefed up version of the command line called Windows PowerShell that has more features and more built in capabilities. I don't use PowerShell much myself, but um, I I, th I think it's probably best uh, to get, you know, use use PowerShell yourself. It, it's typically just a more powerful version of, of the command line. I'm going to carry on here with the command line, though. Um, so again, to run the models or to run uh, any one of these applications, you just type CMD into the address bar and hit enter, and that will open up the command line and it will already be in the current directory, right? So it, it's an easy way of having the command line active in the in the folder that you want to launch it from. You can also launch the command line from the start menu, but you'll notice that I'm not in the right folder now. So what I would have to do is use a, a series of, you know, commands to basically change the directory to the C drive. And then I would say, okay, change CD to the program files. And, you know, I would eventually have to navigate my way to this folder. Much simpler to just type in the address bar, hit CM, type CMD, hit enter, and you're ready to go. Then to run grok, all we have to do is type in grok or grok.exe um, and hit enter. And what I'll point out is that when I do hit enter, we're going to see a whole bunch of, of information printed out to the screen here, or sorry, a whole bunch of extra files um, printed out into this project folder. And simultaneously, we're going to see a bunch of information printed out to the screen in the command line. So I hit enter and it runs very, very quickly. It, it's able to read through the grok file and execute all the commands, which is what it's echoing back here. Uh, it's basically giving us a line by line update on how it's progressing through the grok file. And if we go to the very bottom, we see normal exit. This is an indication that grok was able to successfully run and manage to get to the end of the file, which means we're now safe to move on to the next step. Before we do that, I just want to point out a few key files and a, a couple of key things. First, when you run grok, you may see warnings. And warnings are not fatal. Uh, Grok will be able to encounter a warning, but still carry on and potentially reach the end of the Grok file and, and have this normal exit. But if you do see warnings, it's highly recommended that you, um, you know, you, you should probably read the warning messages and try to see what they're trying, you know, see what they're trying to tell you and uh, and basically address those issues. Uh, so warnings, you know, will often be related to, you know, a command that you've issued that we have since replaced with a new command. For example, in this case, we've used choose nodes top GB, and that's telling us, hey, use this newer command instead. In the case of these verification tests, we we use these again, and we have been using these every month for many years to ensure that the, the solutions are, are still accurate. So we're not ever going to address these warnings, but in your own, you know, in your own workflow, as you build your own models, it's always a good idea to take a close look at these warnings and, and try to address them if you can. If you ever encounter an error, uh, so a warning is again non-fatal and Grok should be able to bypass and move past these warnings. But if you run into an error, then that means it's a, a fatal error. Grok will not be able to finish. You will not see this normal exit, at which point you need to resolve that error. And we'll see a, an example of that later on. Now, aside from um, the command prompt, in the folder, the project folder itself, as we see a bunch of different files have been generated. A lot of these files at this stage are just binary input files that are meant to be just read into PHGS. So we may we may open up a file here like the gen file. OK, this really, I think, is the file that describes the matrix of equations, but it's binary and so it doesn't have any really human readable information. There is one file that's pretty handy at this stage, though, and it's it's what we call the echo file or the dot ECO uh, file. And what this file has is it just the same way that the the command line sort of echoes back information in, and you can see the progress as grok.exe moves through the file line by line 
The echo file does the same thing, but provides much more uh, information. So if we scroll down here, um, we've got a boundary condition called critical depth outlet here. We'll see if we can find the relevant portion of the um, of the echo file. And what we'll see is that it's here. We, here it is. It is writing the same kind of information out. Uh, in this case, it's not really that much more informative, but at the end, okay, we do see some information here about how, you know, it affected a total of 80 nodes in this case. And for the next boundary condition here, the the face, uh, or sorry, the um, the flux boundary condition, which is right down here. You know, we can see information about how this is being applied to 1,372 nodes. So the echo file is similar to the output that you get in the command line, but it has more information. And in addition to that, at towards the end of the echo file, there is always going to be a summary, a summary of the final data set, which lists, you know, all of your different units and physical constraints, a summary of the mesh, including the total number of layers, the total number of nodes, things like that, um, the overall geometry of your mesh, how many nodes are present in individual domains like the porous medium and the overland flow. What th This is really, really valuable, especially early on when you're building models because it basically provides you with a sanity check. You know, you're building a model based on text line you know command based text inputs that means that you're not always going to have an immediate way to visually look at your model so this echo file basically just is a way for you to when you run grok be sure that are things applied as as i had expect that expected them to be there's also a mesh quality statistics section here uh, we often run into issues where models fail to converge because the mesh itself, whether it's you know a triangular element mesh, may have some structural issues in it. For example, you know if you have a triangle that is is so incredibly thin that it eventually collapses to the to a line, then you know that's something that numerically causes a lot of instability in your solution. And so this mesh quality statistics section can be used just to make sure that the numerical mesh that you're using is uh, not problematic. So we, we basically provide a bit of guidance here. For example, the aspect ratio of the triangles in your mesh, you know, ideally the aspect ratio would be one for every triangle in the entire model. That's not always going to be the case, um, but you can at least get some statistics. So if I ever saw that the maximum aspect ratio, for example, was something like 900, that tells me that I have a really, really problematic triangle somewhere in my mesh. And unless I go and fix that, I'm not ever really going to be able to solve the model because I'm basically, you know, I've built my model up on a mesh that is in and of itself numerically unstable. Beyond the mesh summary, then we have a, an update or a summary of porous medium properties. And then if we scroll further down, we'll have similar uh, updates on the you know, other properties, for example, the surface domain and any other domains that may be active. Again, a great file to just check to make sure that everything is as it should be. OK, after grok.exe runs, we go to the next step. So we've talked about what happens after Grok is run. We get all these additional model input files. We should see normal exit. The next step is to run phgs.exe, which is again, the actual solver. It performs the simulation, solves the system of equations. We're gonna do this again, just from the command prompt. So you can do it from the same window. If I scroll down to the bottom, it's ready for me to type in phgs. Don't worry, if you ever close the command line, you can always launch it again. You will no longer see the previous information, the you know the progress that was displayed about grok.exe having been run. But again, that's why we have the echo file, so that, that information is always saved. It doesn't get fully deleted uh, if you close that command prompt. Now I've already run grok.exe, so I don't have to run it again. 
However, I will say that if I ever made any changes to my grok file, let's say I wanted to go and uncomment this skip here and introduce some hydrographs to my model. Now I've made a change to the grok file, which means I need to save that grok file. But the changes that I've that I've made here will not be actually processed until and unless I run grok again. And when I do that, it's going to overwrite all of these files. And that's going to be true of every uh, executable, right? As you run these executables, it's typically going to overwrite files in your file in your project folder. So if you ever want to make a model run and then preserve the results, but then run it in a different way under a different scenario, you want to make sure that you copy that whole project folder so that you don't overwrite and delete the previous results. In any case, um, we'll we'll run PHGS now, and what we'll see is basically what's shown on this slide here. We're going to have a whole bunch of extra model output files generated. We and if everything is successful, we'll also see this normal exit. So PHGS, hit enter, and away it goes. So it's it's very rapidly moving from one time step to the next. It can be hard to decipher what's exactly happening here, but if you ever click here in the command prompt, it will stop. It will pause things so that you can take a moment and look at what's actually happening. And I think this is a good time <clears throat> to actually uh, maybe just take a closer look at at exactly what happens when you do run a model um, time step by time step. The information that's printed out here is extremely helpful. And as you go to run your own models, it, it will pay, uh, it will be very valuable uh, to be able to basically interpret the results here. So at every single time step, we've got one, two, uh, and then three, and then potentially four sections. So four different types of, of data are going to be displayed here. This first section is what we call the global uh, time step update. So this basically tells us that we are currently on time step number 23. Uh, we have target times built into a hydro geosphere model. Uh, in this case, there are nine total target times, and we're currently working towards target time number six. Target times are basically a combination of the output times that you've specified. So here we have nine output times. Uh, so that means we've got at least nine target times. These are basically times where Hydrogeosphere knows that I need to land directly on that time when I solve a time step because I need to produce results at that time step. That means we don't want the, the time step to go from you know 850 to 901 we want it to go to exactly t equals 900. So in this case, we are currently actively working towards global target time six, which is actually 1500. So t equals 1500, which again is just over here. It's in our list of, of output times. We then get into this little table where it says, okay, the, the current uh, progress, it, the, the model is 23.33% finished, i.e. We are currently at T equals 1400, which is 23.33% of 6,000. So the current time, our current time step size, which is in this case 100 seconds. And then it tells us what our T next is. So we are actively solving towards T equals 1500. Now, if the time step ever exceeds that target time, then you'll see something like this. Now, this is just a bit of a quirk. It's not actually exceeding that target time, so it just kind of repeats this line. Um, but if our delta T was, let's say, 200 here, then it would say, OK, our T next is, is 1600, at which point Hydrogeosphere would say, hey, hold on a second. Your next target time is 1500, so we can't take a, delta, a, a time step of 200, back it up and take a time step of 100. So this global target uh, time up, update is basically just the overall progress of the simulation. Now, this next section is called the summary of nonlinear iteration, and it basically provides uh, an update on the Newton iterative solver process. So, at every single, um, you know, at every single node throughout the model, we're trying to solve for a new hydraulic head at the next time step. This uh, table will track uh, 
DelVal and ResVal. These are the key uh, key bits of information here. These are the Newton absolute and Newton residual convergence criteria. So HGS monitors these convergence criteria across all of the nodes throughout the model domain. And when these when one of these numbers goes below the specified criteria, which we also define here in our in our Grok file, then the solution is considered valid and we can then accept that solution and move on to the next time step. So that's what this is basically happening in the summary of nonlinear iteration. It's it's essentially just uh, taking, you know, giving information back about the iterative process of solving the current time step. In this case, it only took one iteration. So this is a very, that's why this model is run so fast. We then get into an adaptive time stepping update. So Hydro Geosphere uses a system of adaptive time steps, which allows the model to run as fast as possible. The model, the model uh, time steps will actually grow and the model will accelerate through the simulation time, uh, but it also monitors changes in key variables so that if there is ever a major change, then Hydrogeosphere will see the change happening and it will slow down the simulation. So if there's ever a time where the, the, the hydrologic system is, is very dynamic and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of change happening. Maybe a pumping well turns on and we start to see a lot of drawdown. Then what we'll see there is that this maximum change, so HGS monitors each one of these variables at all nodes across the entire model. And so it basically looks at all of the changes at all the nodes and it says the largest change in head in this case for this particular time step was 0.11 meters, 10 centimeters or 11 centimeters rather of, of uh, head change. We specify a target change, so that that target is right here. The head control in this case is 0.5. And so based only on this variable, Hydrogeosphere says, you, you told me that I could accept up to 0.5 meters of head change from one time step to the next, but we've only seen 0.11 meters of head change. So it divides these two numbers together and it comes up with a suggested multiplier. So based on the behavior of heads, Hydrogeosphere is telling us we can safely increase our time step size by a factor of 4.2813, and we will then likely still see just 0.5 meters of head change. So HGS monitors not only head, but also surface water depth and saturation and potentially concentrations, things like that. And it will then eventually find the smallest uh, suggested time step multiplier, and it will say, okay, well, Let's use a time step multiplier in that case of, of 3.0158. However, we also have user specified controls here. We've specified a maximum time step multiplier of two, and therefore uh, HGS says, okay, well then I'm gonna use a, a time step multiplier of two, which indicates that basically the next time step will be two times 100. However, we also have specified a maximum time step of 100 here. So in this case, the adaptive time stepping has already caused the solution to ramp up to its maximum speed. So if we move over to the next solving time, we're still going to just be using a delta T of, of 100. Uh, but that's basically the moving pieces. This is how adaptive time stepping works. Finally, if we are at a, a global output time, we've, we've specified that we want to have output written at t equals 1500 well then we're going to see sometimes that it these lines of text where we're basically writing output to files uh, at, at t equals whatever we're currently at and it saves saturations saving heads saving pressure heads etc so this is how to interpret uh, the results or the behavior of of hydrogeosphere as it progresses at every time where it, it does reach one of these target times and it starts to save all of those output files it's going to write a big batch of these binary output files. So here we have, if we take a closer look at some of these file names, we can see that we've got, um, hold on one moment here. Okay, hold on. Sorry, I'm just 
struggling with the view here. Hopefully you can read these. Anyways, at each output time that we've specified, it's going to save a large number of binary output files. So that's all these indexed 0001 files and then 0002. These are all files that would have been written at t equals 300. 0003, these are all files, all data at t equals 600, and so on and so forth. But if we open up any one of these files right now, they're just binary, right? So these are not human readable output files, which brings us to the last step in the workflow, which is to reformat these output files. Before we do that, I just want to point out a few key things. Uh, so first of all, these binary output files are are labeled. The file names indicate the actual contents of the of the file. So the files will always have the project name, which in this case is Abdul. That's just the name of the Grok file. And then an O, which stands for output. And then we've got dot the variable underscore uh, domain. So in this case, head underscore PM, which means porous medium or the subsurface. So this particular file contains hydraulic heads in the subsurface at T equals one. And if we scroll down here, we've got, you know, Abdul O dot Q underscore PM 0005. These are fluxes, water, liquid water fluxes in the porous medium domain at the fifth output time, which would be T equals 1200. There's also velocities underscore V for velocity underscore OLF. That stands for overland flow, i.e. the surface domain. I should maybe make uh, a comment. I'm going to jump, jump ahead a little bit because I'm I keep using the word domain and I want to just clarify something for you. Um, where's the slide that I'm looking for? Here we go. When I use the word domain, I sometimes what I mean is the the overall geographic extent of the model itself. But I may also use terms like the surface domain or the channel domain or the subsurface domain. What I mean in that context is really just the collection of nodes that have one common set of governing equations. So in this image here, we have yellow dots and these yellow dots basically represent locations or points in space nodes where the subsurface flow equations Richard's equation is being solved and then we've also got these red triangles right so these red triangles would basically be the surface domain and it's a little bit hard to see but there are blue lines and in fact there are blue squares uh, at all of these nodes and those would represent the channel domain right so I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. I know it's sometimes can be a bit confusing the way that I use the word domain in different ways in different contexts. Um, but what I was saying before is that, you know, basically each one of these files contains a variable as well as an indicator of for which domain that data um, belongs to. So here we've got sat. This is saturation underscore PM or the porous medium or the subsurface domain. Now, in addition to all of these binary formatted geospatial output files where we're saving data for every single node throughout the model domain, HGS will also save some ASCII or text based files that you can use to actually review key results. Um, and they're, they're not binary format. So one really key file, of course, is the water balance. And this file contains a bunch of preamble here. All of the output files are tech plot formatted, so you can drag and drop these directly into tech plot and start generating charts. Um, so that's what all this preamble is. It basically defines, you know, what variables are, are listed in this file. So in each column, we've got time, fluxes for our critical depth boundary conditions, our flux boundary conditions, the net sources and sinks, changes in storage in the different domains, and then error statistics as well. Um, and then each variable is, you know, defined in terms of what their units are, um, things like that. But basically this file, you know, you can also just load this into Excel. And what this contains is just basically detailed water balance information for the entire model. Um, so it's a global water balance. And this data is saved at every individual time step. So 
whenever the the model finishes running, we're going to have uh, a simulation time report that tells us exactly how many um, you know how many time steps there were. In this case, there were 68. That means that there's going to be 68 rows of data in our water balance. Even though we only we only specified that we wanted output at nine times, there's still a lot of you know there's still a lot of stuff happening in between these specific output times, and so we can you know use the water balance file to see more granular data at every single time step throughout the entire model run. In addition to the water balance file, which is a very very key file. We will also be producing similar files for observation points. Again, we've got all of the different variables listed up here, and um, you know, just basically one row for every single one of those 68 time steps. So the observation points, you know, we basically will flag a single node, and there we're tracking hydraulic head, pressure head, saturation, volumetric water content, fluxes, and then here we have similar. We have H. H not H. This basically means H O in the overland flow. So this particular node clearly coincides uh, with both the surface and the subsurface domain. Um, so it would be a, it would be similar to one of these red triangles where there is both a red triangle and a yellow dot, meaning that this node exists in two domains at once. So we've got observation points as well. Um, there's also you know we had added. In our grok file towards the end, we had specified a few hydrographs, and so those get also written directly to file. So we've got time, surface flow rate, and then flow through the porous media across that hydrograph, and then a total flow rate. One more file that I would like to point out is the .lst file, and this is similar to the echo file. What it does is it basically records all of the same kind of information that we see in the in the command line. You know, it has our global time step update. It has our summary of nonlinear iteration. It's a little bit more detailed, though. It also lists all of our water balance information time step by time step. Then we get our adaptive time stepping and then, you know, we move on to the next time step. So this list file again, it just makes sure that you re retain a record of how the model behaved, even if I do close that command prompt right now. OK, and now moving on to. The next step, which is to OK, so after we've run, um, you know, eight or after we've run PHGS, we have all these binary files. We need to reformat those and we can do that by running. From the command prompt yet again, HS plot. So HS plot when we run is going to produce a tech plot formatted output file. And so. If we take a quick look at the HS plot output file, our output here basically says, you know, here's information about our mesh basically, and then it tells us in the porous medium domain, here's all the different variables, all the different data that I'm going to be writing to file, X, Y, Z coordinates, zone number, head, pressure head, saturation, depth to groundwater, velocities, fluxes, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got similar information for the overland flow or the surface domain. We're getting, you know, coordinates, zone numbers, head, depth, log depth, max depth, velocities, manning friction coefficients. Um, and then after we've run that model, basically what we end up getting are these two large files, uh, one file for each of the domains. So if I open up this Abdul PM file, it's extremely large. It lists all of the different variables that were mentioned there in that uh, command line. But basically what we have here is uh, it's called a block formatted output file. So basically uh, it's listing for all of the, I don't know, 60,000 nodes in this model. It's listing every single variable at every single time step. So if I even try to scroll through this file, it's going to take me quite a long time. If I go right to the very bottom, we can see that I have over, you know, over nearly nearly 800,000 lines of text. So these these files can get quite quite large. Uh, and again, that's why we don't we don't write every file or every output variable directly to, um, you know, a tech plot or a, a text file, just because it's going to chew up a lot of memory basically on your computer. <clears throat> 
Um, so once we've run HS plot, it produces those two output files, which we can then visualize in TechPlot. Now, TechPlot is quite expensive. We also support Paraview, which is free. Uh, I'll show both examples here just briefly. Uh, if I want to take those output files from TechPlot, I can just load them in by dragging and then dropping them into TechPlot here. I'm not going to spend much time really going over the visualization capabilities. We have a whole webinar on our YouTube channel that, that goes over a lot of the details about how to use TechPlot. Uh, but just very briefly, we can turn on our contoured data. This is our model domain here. We can look at the mesh, so triangular element mesh. Right now, we're just looking at zone numbers, um, but we can change the contour data value, maybe look at hydraulic heads over time. We would use these buttons here to scroll forward and backwards through time through those different specified output times. Um, we can, you know, we can incorporate slices if we wanted to turn a slice on here. If I turn the mesh and the contour off, then we can see slices of the model. Again, these are all, you know, they can vary over time. Uh, we can do the same thing with ISO surfaces as well. We can you know, set these ISO surfaces based on any variable that we want. We can look at, you know, where is uh, the depth to ground water equal to, you know, to zero, for example. Um, just different different visualization capabilities here. We can also uh, use this probing tool to probe at any location and get a more detailed report of all of the different variables uh, so that we can kind of, again, you know, just use this to visualize and analyze our results. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, TechPlot. I guess maybe the other quick thing that I'll show is that, you know, we get one output file for each of the different model domains. So this is the surface domain. The, the ver vertical exaggeration here is quite drastic. So we can, you know, change the, change the vertical uh, exaggeration here. And similar to the other uh, forest media or subsurface file, we have all these different types of variables that we can visualize here. So this is surface water depth. As we scroll forward in time, we can see the development of a bit of a stream channel there. Essentially with this simple Abdul model, we just have basically a 50 minute pulse of rain and, and then that turns off halfway through the model. So maximum water depth at the end of that rainfall period and it starts to taper off over time. So yeah, that's a tech plot. And then just very quickly, um, I'll point out that, yeah, we have pair of here support. We can run HGS to VTU, which will reformat the files not to be, oops, not to be visualized in tech plot, uh, but to be visualized as VTU files using pair of And this procedure is just the exact same, HGS to VTU.exe, we hit enter. It reformats all those output files and if we scroll down, we now have a bunch of VTU files. So here we're going to have one file per domain per time step. So rather than just getting one file that contains all the time steps, we'll have one file for each time step. Uh, but what we can do here is we can just drag and drop all nine time steps at once and effectively you know, visualize all the different time, time steps uh, here in pair view. So we just grab all of the files that we want, we drag them in, we click this little button to turn the visualization on. And again, we've got a full 3D visualization of our model here. We can change, oops, the uh, little awkward here. The data that's currently being displayed is here under this coloring menu. So right now we're looking at depth to groundwater, but we could maybe look at the hydraulic heads. And again, we can scroll through time here and see how things uh, behave over time. Uh, just like tech plot, we can we can build in slices, for example. Uh, so what this does is it's truncating our our domain. We can turn on this type of slice here and just get a direct. Oops, this is getting a little awkward here. I don't use pair of view too much, so this is I'm kind of struggling a little bit. Something's going on with the visualization. Anyhow, um, yeah, basically pair of view has 90% of the 
functionality of TechPlot, and it's 100% free. Um, so good, good opportunity or good, good, um, you know, good tool for visualizing your model outputs. Same thing with our OLF domain here. We can see, yeah, again, pseudo 3D. We'll look at maybe the depth of flow. And again, take a look at how that changes over time. So yeah, we're not going to get into visualization, but uh, this brings us to the end of like our quick overview of the, the HGS workflow. You're going to run through those five steps every time you want to run a model, or if you make a change to your Grok file, you need to run through Grok, then PHGS in order to you know, update the model input files and then rerun the model, and then of course, visualize the results. For the rest of the session today, I'm really going to be digging into the Grok file itself and helping you to kind of parse through and understand how these different Grok files are structured and key commands that you can use to build your own models. So up until this point in the tutorial, I've been I've been looking at the Abdul verification model. It's one of our simpler models. It does overland flow and um, porous medium flow. Uh, it's quite simple. It runs very quickly. A great first sort of look at a Grok file and everything. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and we have a uh, an introductory tutorial, and I'm going to use this as as sort of our example model as we move through the rest of the the training session here. Um, it it was included in the package of training materials uh, that um, were emailed to you earlier this week, but if you didn't find it you can always download this tutorial from our website if you just go to quanti.com under hydro geosphere guide for new users you can just click right here intro to hydro geosphere tutorial it'll download a zip file that contains everything that you see here so there are a number of algo mesh or, or rather just data files that we can use to build a mesh using algo mesh We'll get to AlgoMesh in a moment. It's basically a program that helps you to build the mesh for hydrogeosphere models. Um, you don't need to use AlgoMesh for this tutorial. In addition to the, all of the raw data input files for AlgoMesh, I also provide a full mesh file. So you can just run this model. You don't have to, you know, you don't need to have AlgoMesh to run through this tutorial. Um, but this this model itself, the, the Grok file, is very, very heavily commented. So all of this gray text that you see here is, you know, we use um, exclamation marks to basically comment out portions of the file, which can be great for note taking. So this, this particular project probably has more notes than you'll see for any other model uh, in, the, in the history of hydrogeosphere. And it's really designed to be a standalone learning tool. You can just read through this. It's about five or 600 lines long in total. It includes a ton of additional output commands and really is a great, as I said before, all of these verification tests and especially this tutorial, it's meant to be a template for you to sort of start your own models from. You can just swap in information that's relevant to your projects uh, and use this as, as sort of your building block for, for your own projects. Um, so I'm going to use this as as uh, sort of the yeah basically for as as my main main model for the rest of this class here. Um, I'll also just point out that the tutorial folder it contains a PDF with detailed oops um, detailed step by step instructions on how to actually run through the model. So it is interactive. It's got six chapters. Uh, the first chapter is just basically introduc introduction. The second chapter is all about building your model mesh using AlgoMesh. Chapter three is all about putting together a Grok file, uh, all the different sections of a Grok file and key commands at each stage. And then part four is really about running the model and what happens at each stage, running Grok, PHGS, and HSplot. So that's basically what we've covered up to this point today. Uh, and then in part five, we've got some basic guidance on visualizing in both tech plot and pair of view. And then finally, step six is basically suggestions for what you can study next, different, uh, different maybe advanced concepts that didn't fit into the tutorial uh, and recommendations for what you can do after finishing the tutorial.
the whole thing is only about 90 pages long. So if you if you set aside a few hours, you should be able to, you know, maybe maybe an afternoon, you should be able to basically, I would imagine, work through almost uh, the whole the whole project. Um, and like I said, it is very comprehensive. It it, it kind of goes through the full process right from developing the model mesh to building the grok file, running the model, doing some basic analysis of results, uh, covers the whole workflow. Before we move on, I want to just take a quick break and open up the floor if there are any questions. I, I would love to answer them now. Um, but like I said before, feel free to interrupt. Okay, if there are no questions, that's fine. We can just move on. Um, this slide basically just says, it's why do we call it a grok file? Essentially, a grok, grok has uh, come to mean to understand something in a global sense. Uh, so we call it a grok file because just by looking at a basic text file, you can generally understand in a, in a global sense what a model is all about. Um, so that's just a little bit of... I guess, hydrogeosphere history behind the word. So the idea behind a grok file is that all aspects of the model setup are going to be controlled through this file, and that's 99% true. There are a couple of small times where you can modify other files to slightly change behavior, but it's basically the entire model setup is controlled through this grok file. We base the whole thing on a relatively intuitive command-based language. Just like scripting a, a code or a, you know a program, you can use uh, exclamation marks to insert comments, which is really good for note keeping. And as we discovered earlier, there are typically going to be several major model components um, or sections to a grok file. We always start with grid generation, but then there's you know general simulation parameters or options, material definition and material properties, initial and boundary conditions, and then we'll get into numerical settings and time step controls, and then finally output. So we'll take a closer look at each one of these components now. Um, the first true section of any grok file is in fact a problem description. There's always going to be a command called end title somewhere close to the beginning of, of every grok file. This is the first true command in a grok file. Until there is this end title command, uh, everything before here is just notes, basically. And you don't necessarily need to use comments uh, or exclamation marks to comment out notes in this section. So that's why, and again, if you just read through this grok file, I basically explain this. All grok files begin with a problem description. It's simply an area for you to take notes about the model. Until the end title command is encountered, it's not necessary to com out, comment out lines using the exclamation mark character. I've used it here for the sake of clarity and consistency, and then I stop using it, right? So this is the first section of all grok files. It's just for notes. When you exit the end title section, you will immediately enter into a grid generation subroutine. You're not allowed to proceed with the other aspects of defining your model, like boundary conditions or initial conditions, until you define a mesh. And the good reason for that is simply that it is not possible to map, uh, let's say, material properties to a grid that doesn't exist. We want you know, the grid is basically our, our representation of the spatial dimensions uh, that we're recreating in this digital twin. So how can I say where there is a pumping well until we have, you know, a basically a, a where that we can actually, you know, without the grid, the, the mesh doesn't, the model doesn't really exist. So we always start by by defining our grid. It's possible to define simple grids directly in a grok file. For example, this image on the bottom right is a simple grid uh, that was defined using these commands here. Generate uniform blocks. You will likely recall that because we, we looked at this command earlier. Generate uniform blocks. Generates a grid, a rectangular domain made up of uniform blocks. In this case, the grid is formed by subdividing the domain in the x direction into nbx blocks each of length xlen divided by nbx. 
the domain is subdivided in a similar fashion in the, in the Y and Z directions using the other input parameters. So basically what this is saying here is we have a uh, model domain that is 50 meters long in the X direction divided into 100 blocks. In other words, those cells will be half a meter wide. In the Y direction, it's one meter wide and it's one cell. So this is a cross-sectional model. And in the Z direction, the model is 25 meters tall, divided into 50 rows, right? We then have an end grid generation command or an end command, which basically terminates the end grid generation section. And as long as we've defined a, um, a valid grid that, you know, your grids need to be, be defined in three dimensions, for example, um, then we can we can end the section. So, so it is possible to build slightly more complex meshes as well, again, directly in the uh, the grok file. Here we've got a, an example of an interactive command and it's called generate blocks interactive and it's it's an example of what I call a command block where we have an end command that will sort of book end that entire section. And inside this command block, we have a number of other commands that can be used. And these are typically going to be context specific. So here again, we, we've encountered this command, generate blocks interactive. Maybe you're not familiar with it. So your first instinct really should be to go to the reference manual and do a keyword search here and learn more about what this command does. So here it tells us, first of all, it has this dot, dot, dot end, which is an indication that it is a command block and that before we end this command, we're going to need to provide some additional input information. So this causes Grok to begin reading a group of interactive block instructions until it encounters an end instruction. The group should contain at least one instruction for each of the principal directions. And we then move on to the available instructions are grade X, grade Y, and grade Z. And so then we have an example of that of that mesh, just kind of or of the, the structure of this command listed here, and then an image of the resulting mesh. And that's basically what's shown here. Uh, these grade X, grade Y, grade Z, they, they all work in the same way. You basically start, you define X1, X2, so the starting and ending X coordinate, the starting element size, an element size multiplication factor, and a maximum element size. So looking at this on the right here, what this means, is that starting at x equals 75 and ending at x equals 0, we will have a grid cell that is 0 0.01 meters wide. Subsequent grid cells will be 1.5 times the size of the previous one until we reach a maximum width of 5 meters. So from x equals 75, which is over, if you look at my mouse right over here, to x equals 0, that's what's causing this this local refinement here. We start with very thin cells and they progressively grow until they reach a maximum width of five meters, which is maintained until that end point. And these, these commands are all interactive. And so we've chained along a number of other grid, grade X, grade Y and grade Z commands, which all together define the mesh that we see in the bottom right. Again, I would consider this a relatively simple grid. And the reason for that is because it's based on block uh, elements. And you know you have a bit of variable uh, local refinement and, and variable width cells. Uh, however, it's still a structured mesh that, you know, essentially you maintain the same, you know, width and everything throughout the uh, throughout the, the 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 relevant sort of dimension. More often than not, uh, instead of building these regular uh, or let's say um, not regular, but uh, simple meshes, uh, people will more often than not use uh, an external program to define the mesh in the X and the Y direction. Actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to move this slide forward a little bit and say that, uh, yeah, more often than not, we're going to use triangular element meshes and these meshes have typically been designed using algo mesh. The benefit of a triangular element mesh is that you can easily refine your mesh in areas of interest so you can have more refinement 
in you know along this maybe it's a road network or a stream channel for example and less refinement out here in areas that are less hydrologically dynamic let's say furthermore the mesh can conform to boundaries so you do not have to have a fully like a completely rectangular model uh, so that's the major benefits of a triangular element mesh. It, it also allows you typically to minimize the total node count. If we look at a mesh like this, obviously the area of interest might be right where these different areas of refinement meet in the interior of the model. But because that refinement needs to be carried out all the way to the edges, then we have a whole whack of extra nodes out here towards the edges in these refined areas where we might not actually be interested in, in results. So again, more nodes means longer run times. So we do recommend building meshes using an external mesh generator, triangular element mesh generator. We recommend AlgaMesh. We do resell AlgaMesh. It, it, we are confident that it has the best mesh generating and mesh optimization algorithms uh, on the market. Um, so if you're interested in, in you know, purchasing a license of HGS, you can also purchase AlgaMesh from us. And AlgaMesh is covered in the intro tutorial, again in chapter two of, uh, of this intro to HGS tutorial. We're not going to really cover it today though, okay? But what AlgaMesh lets you do is it lets you, in a nutshell, import shape files that that basically define or delineate features or areas of interest. And then you can use an algorithm to basically generate a mesh around these features of interest. You get really highly optimized mesh that uh, you know is front loaded with lots of elements where you want them to be with less refinement in other areas. Another nice thing about AlgaMesh is that it allows you to visually select components of your model to save them later. So in this tutorial, we actually have a clay lens sort of embedded inside the model. The clay lens is well delineated, and so we use a shape file in this case to select all of these elements, and we save them as what's called an echos or a chosen elements file. We can then refer to that later on in our grok file when we want to select the area where that clay lens exists. As another example, um, if I scroll up here a little bit, uh, where, where's the image I'm looking for here? Uh, yes, yeah, so in this image, it's a little bit blurry, but you can actually see right here, right here, right here, and right here, we have four nodes that have been identified. Again, these nodes are ones that coincide with the location of pumping wells in our model. Uh, and so rather than using maybe their exact coordinates or whatever other means we have available to us to select these nodes and define the location of those boundary conditions, we can also use AlgoMesh to just graphically click on those nodes, you know, hold shift and then click on multiple nodes, and then we can save them as an end chose file or a chosen nodes file. This type of file again, can be referenced within our, our grok file. So we can export selections of nodes and, and elements from AlgoMesh and then integrate them directly into our HGS uh, input file. So when it comes to defining a triangular element mesh in AlgoMesh though, it's a 2D thing. It, we define the mesh in the X and the Y dimensions. We then need to sort of propagate out the, the conceptual model in the, in the Z direction. And so that's what this next slide is all about, this generate layers interactive uh, concept. Uh, it's also, if I, if I do a quick word search here in the manual, you can see dot, 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 end. So this is a command block. It causes Grok to begin reading a group of 3D grid generation instructions until it encounters an end. And then there are there are many actually pages worth of of commands that can be used in the context of these generate layers interactive uh, examples. These commands mostly allow you to simply define the elevation of a node sheet in in one or more ways. There are then additional options like sub layering of those of those model layers, defining a minimum layer thickness to address pinch outs and things like that. Uh, but the elevation instructions include like defining a constant elevation, defining the elevation from a file or from a raster, 
from a tsurf file using functions um, and yeah cosine functions or pa pairs so coordinate to elevation pairs so we're going to look at a couple of examples here now this is a pretty simple example that that basically results the the list of commands over here on the left results exactly in this mesh over here on the right this black and white mesh we start by using generate uniform rectangles which is essentially identical to the earlier generate uniform blocks except it only works in the x and the y direction so this basically says x dimension model is going to be 125 meters long from end to end divided into 100 cells and again it's in the y direction it's a cross-sectional model so just one one cell wide or one cell uh, thick i guess in the y direction then we've got generate layers interactive where we then start using a series of interactive commands to define the the layering or the vertical uh, aspect of the mesh so we start by defining the base elevation so this is the bottom of the model at an elevation constant of zero and then we generate a new layer and say it's at an elevation constant of 19 so that would be right around where my uh, where my mouse is hovering right here and we've used this uniform sublayering command to basically just take that that newly de defined layer and subdivide it into 15 layers um, this word sublayering can be a little bit misleading i just want to point out that every one of these quote unquote sublayers is in fact a full model layer so once the grid has been defined then the the whole concept of sublayering goes out the window you you end up with you know we've defined another layer here with an additional 15 sublayers in the end here we would just have 30 model layers we wouldn't have two layers and 15 or 30 sublayers it's just 30 layers and that's that in the third portion of the mesh we or i guess the second section um, since we started with the base we define our elevations using xz pairs and in this case what we would essentially just do is define a list of x and z coordinates that are read until you reach an end instruction uh, basically if you were to say like okay x0 y or sorry x0 z25 and then maybe x20 z22.5 and then you would have a number of xz pairs that basically define the shape of this pothole and then you know carrying on throughout the entire um, throughout the entire model domain in the in the x direction the uh, the pairs in this case are all saved into another text file which is our first encounter of what we what i would call an include file this word include is just it's essentially a command that will redirect hydrogeosphere to some other text file and that other text file is just then treated as an extension of the grok file so in any situations where you maybe have really really long lists of just values maybe it's xz pairs or maybe it's um you know it could be a whole file that literally just has a list of a thousand different observation points defined in it it's essentially just treated as i said as an extension of the grok file and can be a good way of just basic housekeeping of your grok file and making sure that it uh, is not bogged down with too many lines of just text which can be a kind of annoying to scroll through Okay, so this is a simple example of Generate Layers Interactive. Um, before we move on to the next sections, um, we'll, we'll look at a, another example, maybe a bit more realistic, of defining a complex mesh using an AlgoMesh triangular element mesh file and a number of raster files, which would delineate the contact points between major soil units. So there are many different file formats to be used in an HGS simulation. Um, we, we both build our models and output model results into ASCII human readable files. So we know about grok files, the echo file, the list file. There are also many .dat files, uh, for example, the water balance file. Uh, but then there's also a ton of binary files. They're not readable by you, but they're generated using by one of these executables and often will contain you know model outputs for example 
but that's why we provide again HS plot or HGS to VTU to reformat those binary files. We also support a wide range of GIS based files, whether they be raster shape files um, to help you define your model. There's often going to be spatially varying data, whether it's the topography of your model or it's spatially varying precipitation rates. Uh, we have a very wide support for raster files. So highly recommend getting used to working with raster files. You'll, you'll find them to be very useful for many different aspects of building your HGS models. We can also support a number of Algomesh files, as I mentioned, when you're building your Grok file. So not only do we have support for Algomesh mesh files themselves, which define the triangular element mesh in the X and the Y direction, but as I talked about before, we have these chosen nodes and chosen elements files where you can visually select different areas or different nodes or elements within the model mesh in Algomesh and then save those and then reference them in your Grok file later on. And we'll see some examples of that. Now, in the context of our R5 model, let's take a closer look at how this mesh has been generated. So we'll go through here basically layer by layer. Um, first, we we end title. So again, we are immediately thrown into the grid generation section. Uh, so here we use the command read algomesh 2D grid. And what this command does is it basically, we just redirect hydrogeosphere and point it to the location of one of those AH2 files, which defines the, um, yeah, the, the, the two dimensional triangular element mesh. Uh, in the case, uh, we'll, we'll see what it looks like in just a minute. Um, now that the two dimensional X, Y dimension has been defined, we then use generate layers interactive to start building our layers one on top of each other. We always start from the bottom and work our way up vertically, okay? And here we have our first example of using a raster file to define elevations. So we use the command base elevation and then elevation from raster file, point out the file and then end this command block. Now we have a command here, minimum layer thickness with fixed top elevation. What this command does is again, it, it manages to avoid pinch outs. So HGS requires, um, requires us to have continuous layers throughout the entire model domain. Uh, we actually have an HGS user community. I would highly recommend joining it. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to actually open up one of our many, many posts, which kind of explain how different commands work, uh, just because there's a nice visual aid here. But the command minimum layer thickness will push up any lower, um, any, sorry, any upper layer that pinches out. So if there's a pinch out in one of these layers, you know, if they intersect with each other, then what will happen with the command minimum layer thickness is that the upper layer will be pinched up. So we raise the surface nodes. The minimum layer thickness with fixed top elevation version, on the other hand, will push the lower layers down. So it fixes the elevation of the uppermost layer and will simply push down any other lower layers uh, to main, main, maintain that that uh, that continuity of layer thickness throughout the entire model domain. So we do that in this case because we have a raster file uh, that delineates the contact point between our clay unit and the underlying um, sand, and that will actually cause pinch outs in our model. So we we include this command to avoid those issues. If we were to comment out or if we forgot to include a command like this, then we would basically get an error and it would tell us, you know, you've got a pinch out, you've got to figure out how to resolve that. But then we basically use the same approach here uh, for all of our subsequent like upper layers of the model. We basically we use the new layer command to start defining a new layer. In this case, we're going to uniformly sublayer it into two and we define the node sheet elevation. So since the lower elevation of this particular model layer was defined based as uh, as the base elevation of the model, we just have to define the roof of each subsequent soil unit, uh, basically the elevation of the top of that layer. And so we're doing that with a raster file here. And we're just repeating that process here with a different raster file. And then here we get uh, to our 
unit three, which is actually our, our clay layer. So that also is defined using a raster file. And then in the last two sections here, we're actually using the same raster file, roof one underscore R5 underscore elevation. The way that we can do that for multiple layers is by using this offset top command. So what this does is it basically defines the top elevation, but then just drops it down by a meter. And then finally, our uppermost soil layers are defined using a proportional sublayering. So rather than dividing the layer into two uniformly thick sublayers, which is what uniform sublayering does, it instead divides it into three layers that are proportional thickness. So the topmost will be the same thickness as the second uh, upper layer, and then the third layer will be twice as thick as the upper ones. So then we, you know, we end layer, we end the generate layers interactive section. And then finally we end grid generation, at which point we're free to move on with the rest of our model build. I'm going to skip the rest of this model for now. And just to demonstrate what the mesh looks like, we have this command called mesh to tech plot, which doesn't require you to build the whole model. You know, you don't have to define everything about your model, including boundary conditions and initial conditions. We can just use this command early on, again, just to make sure that things are uh, working and that the model is, you know, the model mesh is defined as, as we want it to be. So we type in grok, grok runs. We now have this r5mesh.dat file. We'll launch tech plot here and take a look at it. So first we'll just show some axes here. Um, we'll turn on our mesh. And that's basically it. So you can see the, the overall triangular element mesh structure. Again, we've got that, uh, it's actually a ranch road. It's meant to be a, a road with a distinct overland flow properties. Um, the clay lens is nestled somewhere over here. And if we look at the the, the model from the side, we can basically take a closer look at uh, sort of the layering uh, approach here. So we've got, you know, these two, these two units here. Um, these are uniformly thick. Then we have another two uniformly thick layers. If we zoom in more here, we've got a very, very thin layer. This is basically the minimum layer thickness command with fixed top elevation kicking in because somewhere on the interior, this layer expands and gets thicker and that's our clay unit. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't have, you know, that we have that continuous uh, layer thickness throughout the entire model domain. So that's what that's for. And then another uni two uniformly thick layers. And then finally here at the top, we have uh, two models or sorry, two these are the three proportionally thick layers right so the top most and the second top uh, second upper layer the same thickness and then the third layer is basically twice the thickness of each of these upper ones um, now i should also clarify that when it comes to layer numbering because when you go to select mesh components and maybe select nodes or elements oftentimes you have to provide an input instruction that dis determines the, you know, based on the layer number. Layer numbering and node sheet numbering always starts from the bottom and increases with elevation. So even though I had said that these are layers like one, two, three, in actuality, they are layers uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're layers eight, nine, and 10. So there's our mesh. Um, that's one of the more complex components of building the, the Grok file. The rest of it is, is a little bit simple in comparison. Uh, and that's mostly because there's not quite so many interacting and intersecting commands as there are with the grid generation section. OK, um, we'll carry on here. And what we're going to be doing next is just looking at the different major sections of a grok file that we had discussed earlier. So the next up is um, the general simulation parameters section. What we do here is we generally just define simple commands that that turn on or off different options. 
So by default, HGS is assumed to be fully saturated and to be run in steady state mode. Uh, you can use commands like transient flow to make sure that it's run in transient mode as opposed to steady state or unsaturated to activate the 3D, you know, Richards equation uh, instead of running it under saturated conditions. The command do transport will activate the transport solute transport capabilities like you can define all of the boundary conditions and initial conditions and everything for solute transport. Uh, but unless you include this do transport command, then all of that information is essentially ignored. Um, there's also the dual nodes for whatever domain uh, commands. Those are very important and we always recommend them. If you are going to be incorporating the well domain, then we would recommend incorporating dual nodes for wells or dual nodes for channels or dual nodes for fracture, et cetera, et cetera. Another important command uh, that's not listed right here, but which you will find here in the example tutorial is the no nodal flow check command. The, the nodal flow check is on by default, but it's only required for solute transport models. So if you're running a flow only model, then 100% you should include this command. We also recommend running the model in finite difference mode. What this does is it does a finite difference approximation to the finite element solution method. And in terms of other default settings that we recommend, I'll, I'll point out at this stage that we do have a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel has many other webinars and training sessions that delve into particular aspects of the HGS workflow, whether it's you know, visualizing output with TechPlot 360, or if we uh, go a little bit further back in time, we have an entire um, Algamesh training session. It's about two and a half hours. It's focused entirely on you know, how to build meshes. I would really recommend watching this model convergence and optimizing runtimes with hydrogeosphere video. Towards the end of this video, you're going to find a section, just a summary slide that provides some no nonsense guidance on what kind of sec uh, settings for numerical settings that you should use. So again, we, we really recommend the finite difference mode. We recommend using the dual node formulation. Um, we recommend using just default temporal and spatial weighting schemes. We recommend using the command remove negative coefficients. Um, you know, what's not listed here actually is the no nodal flow check, which should also be on. Um, yes, so these, you know, these, this video is really, really helpful and I would highly recommend it, um, will help you a lot when, when you're building your models. But yeah, general simulation parameters, this section of the Grok file is quite easy to use. Most of the commands are simple one line option, turn on or off some feature, some capability. We'll move on now to, um, well, a bit of a sidebar, actually, I guess. So when you go to build your model and you want to define boundary conditions or you want to define particular property zones, you need to be able to confidently select the mesh component that that are associated with those model input features. You need to be able to confidently select the nodes where you want your pumping wells to be activated, for example. Um, so that brings us to a bit of a sidebar here, which is just about how do you select mesh components? So there are many different components to the mesh. So it's important, first of all, to be familiar with the concept of nodes, which are just points in space, these red dots. Segments are one dimensional straight lines that connect nodes. Then you've got faces, which are basically uh, two dimensional square or rectangles or triangles which are bounded at the edges by uh, segments and at the corners by nodes and then you've got 3d elements which of course are bounded by faces segments nodes uh, and then the concept of layer and node sheets so again i mentioned this before but layer numbers basically layers are just laterally connected elements node sheets are laterally connected nodes and the node and layer numbering the node sheet and layer numbering always starts from the bottom and increases OK, so when you go to do anything in Hydrogeosphere, you first need to know what type of mesh component it is related to. We would apply properties and property zones and material properties like porosity and conductivity to elements, whereas boundary conditions may be applied to nodes or segments or faces as you know, as the uh, situation calls for. 
So the reference manual again is going to provide contextual information about where different types of things can be applied. Uh, but again, just a quick sidebar to make sure that you're familiar with all the different mesh components. And also the fact that there are a, a really a huge number of commands all in section 2.4 of the reference manual uh, that you can use to select mesh components. So uh, if we open up section 2.4 here, or chapter 2.4 of the manual, we have a description of what these different mesh components are, and then we have a subsection for each one of them. So selecting nodes, selecting segments, selecting faces, elements, etc. If we just look at the nodes section here, we can start scrolling and you'll see that there are page upon page upon page upon page of options for choosing nodes um, using a number of different approaches. You can choose nodes based on their zone number. You can choose nodes um, using polyline inputs. You can choose them using polygon inputs. You can choose them. Here we have a command choose nodes top boundary, what just selects all the nodes around the top edge of the surface flow domain. You can provide lists of coordinates to select many nodes at once. You can provide a list of node numbers if you are experienced enough to be able to basically extract the node index numbering. Uh, we can use shape files. We can use AM here. These are those Algomesh NCHOS files. This is a good one to take a closer look at actually. What we have to do here is provide the file name. And then we also need to specify because this file of course is only based on the two dimensional mesh. In that case, we would also need to provide a node sheet bottom and top number in order to determine vertically the range of nodes that should be selected. We can choose nodes based on the node sheet number. We can choose nodes at the bottom of the model. We can choose nodes within a block, uh, you know, basically a user defined range of coordinates. Many, many, many options, and it's helpful to do a scroll through these sections of the manual just to better understand uh, what kind of options you have available. One really important option when it comes to selecting mesh components are the clear commands. Hydro Geosphere will keep your selections in um, in memory. And so before you make a selection, so here, for example, I'm going to choose elements. I also I always want to clear those elements first. Uh, same if we scroll down below to the you know, here where we go to specify uh, boundary conditions. You know, I'm creating a new segment set. Um, well, I need to first clear my chosen nodes and then use a command to choose nodes. So this clear command, these are really elementary and very, very important. So now that we know a little bit about defining um, or selecting mesh components, let's move on to how we define material properties. Now, keep in mind that the properties that are inherent or built into the governing equations of flow for different model domains, those governing equations dictate what parameters or properties actually need to be defined in your model. Um, in order to define or, or activate a model domain, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to parameterize it. So you'll you'll basically choose some mesh components that are relevant or, or associated with that domain and you would create a new property zone and then you would apply properties to them. That basically activates um, the these, you know, these uh, the different domains. Now, if you are going to include multiple domains in your model, we recommend that you define them in this order. It's kind of assumed that whenever you define a 3D grid that the porous medium will automatically be a part of your model. Uh, initially, basically all of your porous medium would by default be assigned to zone one with a bunch of default properties. Um, but we recommend if you are going to be using the dual node formulation that you do that immediately and then move on to the surface and then eventually you know, evapotranspiration. Uh, by far the most common uh, command or sorry the most common domains are going to be the PM the surface flow um, potentially the channel and then very very frequently the evapotranspiration domain and as I mentioned before you know there are different suffixes like OLF for example that appear in file names and will help you to determine 
you know, what domain that particular output is related to. And I guess maybe I'll also point out, yeah, in the literature, in the manuals, you'll often see the words subsurface and porous medium kind of used interchangeably. Same with surface and overland flow. They both basically just mean surface. Uh, overland flow is just a little bit easier to adapt into one of these suffixes. Now, when it comes to defining HGS models, um, I did just briefly mention a moment ago about how the governing equations dictate what kind of properties and parameters you need to build into your model. For example, if you're not going to include, you know, the surface domain, then you don't need to know anything about the overland flow properties, manning friction coefficients and, you know, things like that. If you're not going to be building in evapotranspiration, then you will not need to parameterize things like root depth and leaf area indices. Um, but typically, an HDS model is going to include subsurface flow, surface flow, usually ET. Uh, and so the, the information that needs to go into your model boils down to basically different distributions of soil types and geologic units in the subsurface and associated with those different soil types would be things like hydraulic conductivities, porosity, as well as a relationship to define variably saturated flow. So you can define things like the Van Genuchten functions or brooks cory functions for each soil type. We'll get to that again in a little bit. Um, in the land, so on the land surface, you'll need to define typically Manning's friction coefficients is the main parameter that's going to dictate how uh, well water will flow over the land. Uh, obviously, the topography and the slope of the, the land surface as well is going to have a big impact on that, but Manning's friction coefficients, the main one, uh, and you'd usually define those in the X and the Y direction. And then for evapotranspiration, again, things like root depth, um, evaporation depth, leaf area indices, um, and, and as well as some relationships about how those things like root depth and evaporation depth change over uh, over that vertical you know what you're going to have like more density higher density roots towards the the top of the soil column for example uh, than you would below anyway and then you'll need boundary conditions so climatology data to to force the model basically uh, and so there if you again work at the watershed scale then boundary conditions basically boils down to climatology, precipitation and variably, variably um, spatially variable precipitation and potentially uh, temperature as well, which is going to impact the evapotranspiration boundary. If you have things within your model like rivers and lakes, if you're coming from a background where you you are just a groundwater modeler or a surface water modeler, you will be tempted to build the lakes and rivers in as boundary conditions. but you want to try and get out of that mindset. The lakes and the rivers, streams and ponds, these with a physics-based approach, fully integrated, should be the outputs of your model. You do not need to define the location of a pond and then tell the model that the pond elevation is at a certain, you know, uh, that the stage of the pond is at a certain elevation. Instead, what you would do is you would just basically what we call spin up the model. You might start the model out fully unsaturated and just put in long term average annual precipitation and then wait till the model just fills up with water and you will see these ponds, rivers and lakes reproduced as an output of the model. OK, so again, boundary condition conceptualization tends to be quite simple in, in hydrogeosphere compared to, to other models. So let's get into actual details of how we define properties here. So the method that we really recommend is to use what we call a material property file. Your model may incorporate, you know, dozens or hundreds of different soil types. And rather than defining all of those different soil types directly in your in your grok file and um, you know, having repetitive commands for like, okay, zone one porosity, zone two porosity, zone three porosity. What we recommend is simply defining what we call a, a material property file. So you, we have a material property file for each domain. So M props for the matrix, O props for overland, D props for dual continuum, et cetera, et cetera. And 
inside these material property files, what you can do is define basically, you know, you would define materials. So in the porous medium, you can define and custom name your own material, your own soil types, and for example, medium sand and coarse sand and clay. And those those different material types then become referenceable in your grok file. So let's open up that mprops file and we can take a look at it. Uh, inside a material properties file, basically you have the first line is going to be the name of the material. And this again becomes a de facto command that you can reference in your grok file. And if I scroll down to the very bottom of this section, what we're going to see is that there's an end. So these you know, material names are also command blocks within the context of this, you know, name all the way down to end. We have a bunch of context specific commands that we can use to define the parameters associated with this soil type. So in this case, we've got a medium sand and we're defining an isotropic hydraulic conductivity, a porosity, a specific storage value. You can just ignore that value there. The it's only one specific storage value. Um, and then here we have unsaturated tables. So I mentioned earlier how you can define um, the Van Gunuchten properties or Brook Corey uh, functions themselves to define how flow. Essentially, what these, these functions, the Van Gunuchten and Brooks Corey, do is they define a water retention curve, right? They, they, they define the relationship between water saturation and a relative hydraulic conductivity and between pressure head and the level of saturation. So if we scroll down to the bottom of this file, we've got we've got the medium sand, then we've got here our coarse sand. These are both defined using the tables. If we go to the, down to the very bottom, we also have a clay. So this third clay material, we have actually defined the unsaturated Brooks Corey function. So we define it air, in, air entry pressure, residual saturation, exponents, and any other you know, parameters that we want to define for this function. If we don't define it, then we'll just get default values. Um, and this is enough to basically define how flow will occur in the, sat in the variably saturated zone. However, these functions can be computationally intensive and so it's often going to be faster to just define a list, a table of values, basically. So we have a command here that allows you to generate these tables. So it will take the unsaturated Brooks Corey function as we've defined it here, and it will spit out some tables of values, which can then be swapped in. And those tables of values basically would be the, similar to this. Um, so rather than defining Van Gunuchten or Brooks Corey, we can just say, hey, we're going to put in tables of unsaturated values, and then you simply provide a table of, of saturation versus relative hydraulic conductivity. So at a saturation here of 18%, the hydraulic conductivity of our coarse sand is going to be 0 0.000445 uh, times this absolute K value. And then if we scroll down, we can see that this saturation eventually is defined right from a uh, value of 18% saturation down uh, up to 100% saturation, where the hydraulic conductivity is then 100% of that K, -isot K isotropic value defined up there. And similarly, we have a pressure head versus saturation relationship. So at a, at a pressure head of negative five, we would have a saturation of about 18%. And then we basically define that all the way to uh, essentially a zero pressure head where we have a full saturation. So these tables are, are effectively replacing the functional relationship of Van Gunuchten or Brooks Corey, and they're typically faster to process than actually the, the functions themselves. So within this in this file, we've defined three materials, and then those three materials are then simply named within the grok file. So what we do then, the, the overall process is laid out right here in the in the grok file. I also have a slide here which basically explains how we do it. But essentially, we first indicate which medium we're working in, which domain we're we're working in. So these commands here use domain type. They're also very important. We want to make sure that we're 
working in the context that we want to be working in. Uh, so here we're trying to define porous medium properties, so we want to make sure that we're using domain type porous media. Then what we're going to do is we're going to indicate the file name uh, of the property file. So we use the command properties file and then specify the name. And that's what I've done here as well. Properties file r 5 mprops. That's the file that we were just looking at. We then will define material zones and then select a zone and then simply choose a material type from the property file. So in this case, it's very simple. We're applying the same properties. In this case, the named material is board and sand field scale digitized and all that property will be applied to all zones in this case. In the R5 um, tutorial, it's a little bit more complicated. Instead, what we've done here is we've first defined our zone numbers using a raster file. So if we look at this PM underscore zones dot ASC raster file. It's basically just a raster file, which is a gridded data product that. Basically allows you to spatially define some value. So there's ones and twos basically in this uh, row by row cell by cell in here. This is the two zone and then out here we've got the one zone on both sides. So this raster file is just a way of spatially defining. The, the distribution of different soil types in in the case of our model, the all the areas that are associated with one are a, a medium sand and then in the two we have a channel of coarse sand basically moving through the model domain. So here we, we clear our chosen elements. We choose all elements in the entire model in the entire porous medium domain, and then we read zones from a raster for those chosen elements. So that basically overwrites the previously defined property zones, which by default are just one throughout the entire uh, area. Then we clear our chosen zones. We choose zone number one. We read the properties of medium sand, and then we clear chosen zones zones choose zone two read properties coarse sand now you may remember that we had a uh, clay lens in there as well so our clay lens is currently assigned to one or the other or maybe both of these different property zones we can always overwrite previously assigned data and so that's what's happening here we're going to clear chosen elements we're going to choose elements am so this is using one of those algo mesh products the echos file that i mentioned earlier and similar to that nodes command, we also need to specify the, the node sheets or the layer numbers where this, uh, this clay lens exists. So we're basically saying, you know, we're using the echos file to graphically select the elements in the X and the Y direction that fall within this polyline or polygon rather. And then we're further specifying that we want to select the elements that are between node sheets five and six. And we reassign that to zone three, and then we choose zone three and then reassign the properties to be the clay material. And this is how we recommend defining materials uh, in a hydrogeosphere model. It's possible as well to use a raster file to define really. Uh, if you have a raster file, for example, that delineates in fine detail the distribution of hydraulic conductivities throughout your model, you can assign properties directly onto the mesh that that sort of avoids the whole zone numbering uh, and material named material properties uh, process. But you'll find that this is typically a much uh, cleaner and more organized way of approaching your model uh, property definitions. And it's the exact same overall process for the surface domain as well. Uh, in this case, though, the surface domain is a two dimensional domain. So instead of assigning the zones to elements, we we cr we basically create the zones based on chosen faces at the top of the model. Um, and yeah, that's so basically we're just again following the exact same process here. What we can do is we can also open up the OProps file. And we can see it, it works the exact same way as well. We have a named material, in this case, grassland and ranch road. And we're defining the Manning's X and Y friction coefficients. Uh, real storage height basically allows us to store a bit of water in the overland flow bef uh, domain before it starts flowing away, just to represent subgrid features. In other words, like rills that are 
small topographic, you know, rails on a field, for example, uh, that we are not able to fully build into the topography of the model, as well as a coupling length. So this this uh, determines, you know, if, if we look back to our governing equations up here, the coupling length is essentially this D naught term. The, uh, the conductance then is basically uh, going to be a default value. Uh, the, again, the, all these default values, I should point out, if we go to the relevant section of the manual here and de defining materials and material properties, we have a subsection for each one of the major domains. Um, we look at uh, saturated porous medium flow, for example, we've got all the default values are listed here. So as I mentioned before, if you don't define something, then it will be defined for you. But oftentimes these parameters are not used. So for example, the Poisson's ratio, solids compressibility, loading efficiency, these are only used under certain niche kind of conditions. Um, okay, so I think that basically covers assigning material properties. We have a couple of ex other examples here in the slides. You can use these to refer to again later on if you ever need more examples to look at. Um, this slide here just kind of lists and, and clarifies and points out that each different material property file and each different model domain has their own unique set of properties, right? So in the porous medium, you're going to be defining hydraulic conductivity, specific, uh, specific storage, porosity, the unsaturated flow relationships. Uh, in OPROPs, you'll define friction coefficients, real and obstruction storage height, max flow depth. There are many other properties as well that that I haven't quite listed. So again, you know, it's definitely worth doing a, a scroll through these sections of the manual to see what kind of other properties can you apply. So for example, time varying friction coefficients. Uh, these fr time varying friction can be used as a way of sort of spoofing the impacts of like winter conditions, for example. You know, we know that there's not a lot of overland flow of precipitation in the winter because it all falls as uh, solid snow. And so you might turn on uh, a time varying friction to really increase the, the Manning's roughness or friction coefficient in the winter months to basically reflect the fact that it's not liquid water that's falling. It's not going to be easy to, for that to flow downhill. Then we've got things like real storage height, obstruction storage height. They all refer back to a section of our theory manual as well. So you can learn more about, you know, what are these values and how do they actually fit into the uh, into the um, into the governing equations for for flow. OK, so well, then we'll just a quick note about initial conditions here. Um, you do need to define initial conditions for all domains. So you basically pretty much pretty simple to do. You choose the nodes where you want to assign some initial condition, and then you basically assign the initial condition using one of the many commands that are available, and they're in section 2.6 of the manual. Commonly used ones include um, this initial head, initial head surface elevation, uh, as well as initial head from output file. Um, the recommended approach is typically to apply in the early stages of your modeling pr process or in the early stages of your, your overall project to define some arbitrary initial head and then to just run the model for a long, long time using long-term average climatic forcing data until the model reaches some sort of equilibrium, right? At which point you can use the results from that long-term average state as the beginning as the initial condition for subsequent simulation so you would basically take one of the output files uh, for example if we were to look at uh, our abdul model again here like we could take after our at the last time step we could use this head distribution file as the starting point for subsequent simulations using this command here initial head from output file and I'll point out here as well that this model convergence and optimizing runtimes um, webinar that I mentioned earlier, it has a lot of it has a lot of really helpful kind of tips in terms of how you should approach the the overall modeling process. Like we talk about steady state versus transient flow, 
we talk about how you can use, you know, um, the output from one model to generate a more meaningful condition for subsequent simulations. We give you a couple ideas on what a like sort of an appropriate model workflow would be. Start with a single domain or maybe, you know, maybe have PM and OLF and then use an arbitrary initial condition and run it over a long period of time until you get some sort of pseudo steady state distribution of heads, at which point you use that to to be the starting point for more refined uh, monthly or daily simulations. And then once you've done that, maybe then you come back and you, you reintroduce a new process like evapotranspiration. And again, you would try to run that uh, over a long period of time using a more intelligent initial condition. So there are many options on what, you know, different commands that you can use to specify initial conditions. Um, initial head using just an arbitrary constant value. You can base your initial head based on the surface elevation. Um, you can use a depth to depth saturation table. You can base it on output files. A lot of different options here. Uh, but again, this this is a really good uh, webinar to to just give you more context in terms of what a good overall workflow would look like uh, when you're building up an HGS project. So a couple of examples here, you know, just use domain type, make sure you're working on the right domain, choose all nodes. Here we've defined an initial arbitrary head of 2.78 meters. Um, this is again from the Abdul example, and we've defined an initial water depth of almost zero. I will say that in the surface domain, um, we don't usually recommend setting a, an initial water depth of exactly zero because zeros are, they're just, they can be numerically unstable. It's hard to handle a perfect zero in a lot of these models. So what we usually recommend is applying a, a very, very close to initial, uh, very, very close to zero initial water depth in the surface. OK, 30 minutes left here. I think we have plenty of time. Um, we'll cover boundary conditions now. So section 2.7 of the reference manual is where you're going to find all the information you need. Um, we have basically in this section of the manual uh, a section on general, which lays out the overall approach to how you're going to do it. Um, we talk about creating sets. So uh, boundary conditions are a special case where you need to create a set of pre-chosen mesh components. You can, for example, choose a bunch of nodes and then create a node set called pumping wells. And then you would use that note, that named set as a, uh, a building block for defining the boundary condition. And then the next section here is type, where we have a subsection for all of the different types of boundary conditions that can be applied. Specified heads, specified fluxes, fluid transfer, free drainage, potential evapotranspiration, rivers, drains, tunnels, a whole bunch of them. Um, let's basically just take a look at what the overall process looks like. Uh, before you do assign a boundary condition, you have to create a node set, face set, or segment set. The, the type of set that's going to be required is basically going to be listed or explained in the manual. So pretty much every boundary condition type that we provide or that we support, we provide an example here. And you can just see here, based on the context, that tunnels require a segment set. If I was to go to specified head here, we can see that a head boundary condition requires a node set for a specified flux that requires a face set. So just keep that in mind. Um, and yeah, basically this is what the process looks like when you define a boundary condition. You're gonna first create a set and then you'll you'll use the boundary condition code block. And then inside that block, you're gonna define the type using the type command. You're gonna define which set it is, the node face or segment set using the node set face set or segment set command. And then you'll define the actual magnitude or like the actual boundary condition values, typically using a time value table. But if it's a spatially varying boundary, you can, you can also use a time raster table or even a time file table. Some boundary conditions also have optional constraints um, or just optional commands. So here's an example. We first you know, choose some elements of the mesh, some components, and we, in this case, have created a face set. We then enter the boundary condition code block. We're defining a uh, the type as a flux. We say the face set, and then we 
use the named value, the top face set. And then here we have a time value table. So just starting at t equals zero, we have a flux of a certain amount. And then at t equals 3000, that flux turns off. So this is also from the Abdul test case. So very simple, you know, time value table. We turn rain, in this case, it's meant to represent rain. We're basically applying it to all of the top faces in the model, two centimeters per hour of rain. The flux boundary condition, if I open it up here, it sets the input type to be a general specified flux boundary condition. The input flux in length per time, i.e. millimeters per hour, centimeters per hour, is converted to a volumetric flow rate by multiplying by the contributing era area of the chosen faces. So again, it's not a volumetric flux that you're applying. It's important to be aware of that fact. So anytime you use a boundary condition, make sure that you you carefully read the description for any any boundary condition, but also any command that you use. Um, and yeah, so we assign values and then here's a, an, one of those optional commands, tech plot output. I recommend including this for all boundary conditions. It basically is just going to create uh, an easy to parse output file that basically, uh, for example, we've got three right here. It basically just saves the spatially varying flux values and you can load these BC output files which are generated using the techplot output command into techplot. Um, some boundary conditions also have constraints. So if we look at the head boundary conditions, for example, uh, or rather, sorry, um, it is a specified flux. The flux nodal boundary condition is, is actually a volumetric flux that you apply to a specified node, often can be used to represent pumping wells, for example. Um, but as you can imagine, if you apply a very high pumping rate, then a drawdown cone will form and it, it's possible that that area will become desaturated. At which point, um, if you don't provide any constraints on that boundary condition, then it will essentially be trying to pump a dry well, which is not something that can be done in, in the sense of a numerical simulation. You can't remove water that that isn't there uh, so that becomes numerically unstable and hard to solve so you can include constraints for some boundary conditions so an example here is the nodal flux reduction by pressure head where you you define a minimum and maximum pressure head and the flux rate itself will will vary as you you know as you dewater that well as the as the head um, drops and we approach the minimum pressure threshold, then basically the actual flux value will turn to zero. You know, it'll first it'll slow down. And then if we get below that minimum pressure head, then the flux goes straight to zero. So some boundary conditions also support these constraints. Important to just again, read through the manual, see what kind of options are available to you. Um, we can look at a couple of examples here in our R5 um, example model. Uh, here we're, we, we've, I'll skip over the initial conditions section because it's really basic, um, but we get to boundary conditions here. Again, this grok file itself provides step-by-step -step instructions on how all this is done. Uh, in, in our model, we've got, I think, four boundary conditions. Uh, we've got two critical depth boundary conditions in the surface domain. Now, a critical depth boundary condition what it does is it basically maintains the critical depth of flow. And actually what I'll do here is I will, um, oh, it's not in this presentation, Never mind. Essentially, if any water at a, a node or a segment set where a critical depth boundary condition exists, it will simply transport that water out of the model, right? So we typically apply critical depth boundary conditions to the edges of our model domain, which prevents water from pooling infinitely in the surface against the sides of an imaginary wall. Uh, so here we've got a critical depth at the model outlet where we expect water to flow out over the over the surface of the model. And then we also have applied a critical depth to the rest of the model just as an insurance policy and you know so that water is able to flow out of the model should it start to pool at those edges. And then here we have a boundary condition for that's called rain. We've applied it to the entire 
top of the model. So it's just basically a constant uh, flux of rain, 0.2 centimeters per hour. And that'll stay on for the entire model duration. Uh, if you ever wanted to change that over time, right, we would just add in a different, um, you know, at maybe, I don't know, we'll say after 600 seconds, 10 minutes, we could we could just basically turn this water off and have it, uh, whoops, um, go to zero, for example, right? We can also use time raster tables. So if we had a very large watershed-based model and we know that we have spatially varying precipitation rates, what we would do is we would just basically put in a time raster table and instead of having a single value here, we would just basically direct, you know, we would direct HydroGeosphere to go and look for the raster file. Oh, a quick comment actually about this. Um, I, you'll see this dot forward slash or or dot um, two forward slashes sometimes, or rather, sorry, two dot 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 forward slash. This is basically shorthand to mean in the current folder, uh, whereas dot dot will basically say back out of the project folder one level. So in in the um, in the R5 example, we have much of our um, much of our information about uh, like the the mesh files, for example, and our echos files. They're saved into a mesh folder, and so what I can do, like what what you'll see throughout this uh, tutorial, are things like this, where I basically say dot forward slash mesh. Look in the mesh folder, and you'll find this file. If this mesh folder was saved potentially one step outside of our project folder, then we would want to type in dot dot mesh. And that basically says, OK, relative to where my grok file sits, let's back out one folder and then look for the mesh folder. OK, so this is a really key um, sort of file management technique. If you imp if you include basically absolute file uh, paths like this, and then you go to share this model with someone. Uh, when the model is sitting on their other computer, right, the the absolute file path will no longer be valid. At which point, you have to start going through their Grok file and updating every single, you know, f uh, file path. Um, so saving all of your project files into um, into a single project folder can be really just like really good file management and will save you a lot of time whenever it comes time to share the model with someone else. You can just package up the whole folder and send it over to them and it will run out of the box without them having to make any updates. Um, so back to our boundary conditions though, right? We've defined this face set, we define our rain boundary, and the only other one is our wells. So earlier I mentioned how we could use the algo mesh to select a bunch of pumping wells. And then we we use that choose nodes AM command and specify that they're in node sheet two, create a node set for wells, and basically you know same pattern we apply the type here, we provide the node set, and then we have a time value table. And this basically cycles these wells on over the course of 24 hours. They turn on and off every six hours or every 21,600 seconds, and the pumping rate is negative 100 liters per hour which we have to always convert into our project units. Uh, that's something I haven't mentioned yet, actually. All inputs in your Grok file have to be in the units that you specify um, up at, usually at the top, right? So here, everything in this, um, in this Grok file is defined in kilograms, meters, and seconds. Now we have one other boundary condition, actually. Uh, this R5 model incorporates evapotranspiration. So we define a PET, potential evapotranspiration. A uh, quick side note about evapotranspiration is that when you define ET, this is the, the upper limit on the potential evapotranspiration. But given the fact that uh, evapotranspiration is only possible if there is water available, uh, we will also need to define the ET domain. 
So that's done using the usual approach, right? We just have an ET props file, which has things like root depth and leaf area indices. And what this does is basically the ET domain will calculate an actual evapotranspiration rate based on the current hydrologic conditions. If there is water, then water is available to evapotranspirate. So if the actual evapotranspiration rate is ever less than the PET, then the, the AET or actual evapotranspiration rate is applied. If the actual evapotranspiration rate that is calculated exceeds the PET, then instead we will we will defer to the maximum like potential evapotranspiration rate. So evapotranspiration is the one domain that is kind of special in this sense where you need to apply both um, a, a ET properties and define the whole domain, but then also define a boundary uh, a boundary condition for it. Finally, we get into numerical settings. Um, so we've already actually talked a bit about this. I'm not going to go into a de detailed description of what the model output shows in the list file and everything um, and in the command prompt. Most of the commands here are pretty simple to use. Check sec section 2.5.2. The main things you'll want to probably define are initial time, maybe initial time step size, minimum and maximum time step multipliers. Uh, really important command is output times, which that specifies the times where you're going to save a snapshot of model results. It also controls how long the overall simulation lasts. So in this case, the model is going to run for 24 hours or 86,400 86, seconds. But other than that, you know, you also need to define your Newton convergence criteria, things like flow solver settings, um, Newton maximum iterations, and then there's also those control settings. So for the adaptive time stepping controls. Um, so the reference manual here, just in case you're interested in diving in a little bit more into how the time stepping works. Um, we have a section Appendix C here provides a detailed description of the runtime output and defines what all these different variables are, and then also has a description about how the adaptive time stepping update works. There's also a good description of all of these things in part four of the manual, right? Where we basically I provide just detailed step by step instructions on how to run the models and as we run the models, what files are created, what kind of output we see at different stages. Uh, so again, reading through this, this tutorial document is going to be very valuable. Um, so yes, runtime output, we've covered that. Uh, the last part uh, or last section that you're going to see in most files is output control. So again, I don't want to really dwell on this too much. Most of these commands are pretty easy to apply. It's things like flagging observation points or defining areas where you want to have an, a hydrograph. Uh, you can track fluid volumes um, over particular areas of interest. We also have a section at the end of the, the tutorial, and it's also in the tutorial document about particle tracing. This does increase the, the runtime a little bit, so I'm going to skip I'm going to skip this part of the of the grok file. We're not going to run it right now. Uh, but that basically brings us to the end of the file, right? So output control, as I mentioned before, we can get detailed time step by time step data with observation points, the water balance, fluid volume tracking, hydrographs, whereas most output is going to be um, the binary outputs, of course, only are only written whenever we define it in that output times command. And that yeah, that's the end of the grok file. So that kind of covers all the major components and gives you a couple of different examples that you can look through and keep find detail and see exactly how all these things fit together. Um, you know, once we, you've written that grok file, you run grok to pre-process your model and generate the actual matrix of equations. We then will run PHGS to solve the system and run the simulation. And then we're going to reformat our outputs using HS plot or HGS to VTU so that we can uh, so that we can visualize them. Um, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to run this model with you. And there's a couple of key things that I just want to point out when it comes to this particular uh, tutorial. So first of all, if I run grok, we're going to get an error. I wanted to highlight that you will always run into errors 
building a Grok file is, is certainly a trial and error thing. It's going to be a repetitive process. In this case, if you run into an error, um, we need to resolve it. In this case, it's easy. We, it says unrecognized boundary condition type and potential evapotranspiration. So that's just a typo. That's easy to fix. So I'll just scroll back up to here to pipe my potential evapotranspiration boundary, replace that O with an I, save the file. So control S to save, and then I'm going to run grok again. And here, OK, time raster table. That's because I made a change earlier. This is a time value table. So again, OK, like I said, it's a trial and error here. We should get through it this time. Perfect. Again, warnings are definitely worth reviewing and potentially updating. I will have to come through and update this tutorial soon. Um, but we get a normal exit, so we can move on to running PHGS. And here what we're going to see is some peculiar behavior. Um, and this is something that people run into frequently as an issue. If you ever, if your model is not able to converge on a solution in the, the, the number of available Newton iterations, so in this case we've specified that we can have 12 maximum iterations. If the model is not able to converge on a solution, then what happens is the time step will be cut in half. And if we start with a time step of 0.5, and if we let this go for just a few time steps, we will very quickly have a time step that is shrinking, 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 and getting smaller, 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 smaller. So this is problematic behavior. We do not want to see this. And what we need to do is find a way to resolve this behavior, either by modifying numerical solution criteria or by revisiting our conceptual model. Sometimes you've got a really wacky set of boundary conditions that are just circular logic type things that are impossible to solve. Other times it can be due to actually just the numerical solution criteria. In this case, and I, I did this in person or on purpose in the tutorial, and there's a whole section uh, that basically it's uh, I'll go right to this section. Um, basically, it's in section 4.2.2 where you know it will basically point out that the model is not running. Why is that? And what you're going to be instructed to do is open up the debug control file and make some changes. So. The debug control file, which I'll open right now, is a file that is read at every single iteration of the Newton solver and at every time step. What it does is usually it encounters this first line debug off and it knows that, okay, well, I can just basically ignore the rest of the file. What this file is designed to do is to allow us to modify some behavior of the model on the fly. We can have it pause whenever it completes a time step. We can have it write output files um, basically at the current time step. So if the model is struggling and you, you want to create a snapshot of results so that you can see what's going on at that moment and better interpret those results to try and help you resolve that error, you can use this command here. You basically just need to uncomment out these, these uh, lines by you know, deleting the comment button. Now the true issue in this model is that the residual and absolute convergence criteria are far too tight. And so in order to bypass this error or this issue of the time step being cut in half, I can actually change these criteria while the model runs. I don't have to stop the model and restart the model. So I make a change here, I save this file, and as soon as I hit enter, those changes will automatically be applied. And so we see it, it was able to solve that, that uh, the, the solution basically in the, the next iteration of the Newton solver just by updating those, those simulation criteria. But it's also going to be paused at every time step because I had commented out or had added this line, pause time step. Uh, so I can press a button to continue. And it will carry on and will solve and then pause and solve and pause. And it will continue doing that until I come back in here and eventually, you know, add back in this this comment so that I don't have to pause it anymore. 
And at this stage, what's going to happen is the model is going to start to pick up steam again. It's going to start the adaptive time stepping will kick in and the time steps will start to grow. And whereas before they were shrinking, now they're going to start to grow faster and faster. And we'll basically be able to blast through this model in uh, maybe a minute or so. Uh, at which point I'll just very quickly load the results into HS plot and uh, you know kind of wrap things up. But while we're waiting here for the model to run again, uh, just like to open the floor to questions. It's been very quiet and I'm sure everyone's head is spinning. There's a lot of information. Um, but yeah, let me know if there's anything that's not clear. I'd, I'd be happy to take questions now. Okay, if there's no questions then, oops, uh, shoot, I ran PHGS again. Okay, I'll just stop that and uh, we'll run HS plot, which should combine all the files together. Um, so we run HS plot, we get one output file for each of the uh, model domains. So we've got OLF and PM here. Just load in the pm.dat file into techplot and take a very brief look at our, our simulation results. So we just drag and drop it in. Might take a moment to load up. And yeah, we'll just take a look at those uh, results. But I would, I would say uh, for anybody on the call today, as you want to take your next steps in learning about hydrogeosphere, highly, highly, highly recommend um, going through this intro tutorial. You know, find detail. You, you can skip sections if they're not relevant to you. For example, if you're not going to be using AlgoMesh, but uh, it really covers everything that we've talked about today, plus much, much more. Uh, and it goes over it in, in fine detail as well. So if I wasn't able to explain something in a way that was maybe clear to you, uh, the tutorial is a great place to sort of get a secondary uh, sort of explanation. Although I have to admit, I did write the tutorial, so it might be just as confusing. Um, but yeah, here's our model where we can see, you know, the distribution of, of material property zones right now. Um, here we've got zone one and zone two, so it's our medium and our coarse sand. I've turned on a slice here, and so if I turn off the contours, uh, we can modify slightly the display setting here, and, and that's basically where our clay lens is there. So I mentioned it kind of exists in the middle of the model domain there. So there's a clay lens in there, and uh, we turn our contours back on. We can look at some different model outputs. So uh, we started with a kind of very um, just a generic initial head based on depth to uh, depth from the surface. So one meter below the ground surface. So our head kind of varies spatially based on the topography of the of the solution or of the model. Uh, as we scroll forward through time, we can start to see the model essentially moving towards some sort of different equilibrium state. Um, so we've got, yeah, basically heads there. We've got our uh, saturation levels. So initially the model is essentially almost fully saturated, except the top meter of soil is, is fully unsaturated just based on that initial head distribution. As we go forward in time, we can start to see the upper soil layer getting progressively more saturated as that rain infiltrates. Uh, and then eventually, you know, towards the end of the model, we start to see a full saturation in this uh, bit of a channel here, which is what might eventually form as a stream. Um, we can quickly, again, just load in our overland flow and we'll see something kind of similar here if we turn on contours. These are our different property zones. So that's, you know, it's all a grassland, but we've got this ranch road as a distinct property zone. And maybe we look at uh, the surface water depth and over time, essentially all the water infiltrates and still until the very end of this 24 hour rain period, we start to get a little bit of pooling here towards the lower edge of the model. If it was to continue raining and raining while well, the topographic low point is actually up here at the top. So eventually water would just flow right out of the model. So 
yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's a whirlwind tour, an introduction to hydrogeosphere. If you don't have any questions right now, that's perfectly fine. You may encounter questions as you work through the tutorial. Feel free to reach out to me. My job here at Aquanti is to help new users to explore the software and, and basically overcome the learning curve. And so I'm always open to uh, to helping new users. Feel free to reach out anytime, whether it's via, e via email or we can set up a, a call like we're on right now. Um, I'm, I'm here to help. So I guess I'll, I'll just one more time open the floor to questions. And uh, if not, I will call it an afternoon. I'll get this video um, edited for everyone and follow up in a day or two with a link that you can watch uh, there on YouTube. No question for me, but thank you. OK, thanks for coming, Klima. Yeah, thank you, Brian. No questions from, from my side, but thank you very much. Excellent. Hope it was very, uh, hopefully it was very uh, informative and not too confusing. OK, well, thank you all again for joining me. Um, hopefully I'll hear from you soon with some questions and uh, I'll help you through this learning process. OK, so I'll end the, uh, end the recording there. And 